Good evening and welcome to Open Your Mind Internet Radio. We have myself, Alan James. And my mic is not even on. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, and you have, have myself, Stephen George, as well. Very good evening. Good evening to everyone. We have a, a, a packed show with loads of information, so we're going to get on with the communication channels. We are on the slow player on TNS at the moment. The fast player is not up and running, so if you want to hear us, uh, just um, click on the slow player if you want to do that, if you're not going to use the Ustream player itself. Steve, communications. Communications info at oymireland.com for your emails throughout the show and throughout the week. We also have the chat facility on the website uh, which is up and running at the moment. There's a few people logged in there so I'll say very good evening to all of you. Uh, if you're interested in joining in the chat just uh, navigate to oymireland.com. On the left hand side halfway down you will see the chat. Just click on there. Log in with your real name or a pseudonym. Uh, you can join in the chat there and, and join join in the fun that goes on. Uh, we also have the guest book on the website as well. If you want to leave a message, you're more than welcome for this generation and future generations. Uh, that's uh, that's where you can do that. And uh, we also have, last but not least, if you want to communicate with us over the uh, phone, you can. Give us a call on 046-927-1212. Oh, four six nine two seven one two one two. If you're ringing from in, ringing in from outside Republic of Ireland, it'll be zero zero three five three in front of that. Alan, right? We have a lot to get through. We have a pre-record of Marcus McKeown. Marcus, uh, we did a pre-record of Marcus a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to be playing that tonight. Now it's going to be about an hour and a half with Marcus, but we have a few things to talk about as usual before we get Marcus on. The one of the things is just quickly on donations. Uh, we mentioned on the site there and last week that we're looking for a frequency counter which will complement the RF detector that we purchased uh, through don- donations so we can start scanning. So if you have a few pence or if you can, if there's any adverts on the OAM site that you fancy, click on the advert and all you know donations go to our fund to raise money for the uh, RF detector or the frequency counter, I should say. And we'd like to get that in. But we're going to try and get the training done with Lars and Jesse during the week if we can. And then start the actual scanning. So we'll keep you posted on that. Steve? Yeah, uh, we did an interview. Anyone who who was listening last week knows that we did do an interview with uh, Stuart Swerdlow last week. Last uh, Sunday morning in Dublin Airport. We, we, We hooked up with Stuart. We found a nice, a nice quiet location, uh... We kind of scoured the, air, the airport, found a lovely, quiet location to do a little bit of an, in, an interview with Stuart. Um, as it turned out, as soon as we started the interview, the nice, quiet little alcove where we were turned into the noisiest place in the airport. So, well, not to, not to be deterred, we did the interview anyway, and it's now up live. Um, I think it only went live possibly about ten minutes ago. Uh, we just got the thumbs up from Stuart. He's quite happy with it, so it's uh, it's up live on our YouTube channel for anyone to take a listen to or take a look at, whatever you fancy. And uh, it, as I say, it is kind of a little bit in the noisy side, but we've all kind of listened to it. And um, sorry, I need to move the mic. Uh, it is it is up alive. the The audio is it's okay. I mean, I've listened to it. Alan's listened to it. Stuart has listened to it. And it's it's acceptable that there is a little bit of background noise, but at, at the end of the day, you know, the, I think the message is more important, and uh, Stuart delivers it uh, ever ever so eloquently. So uh, as I say, that is up live on the YouTube channel, as I'm from approximately ten minutes ago. So maybe after the show, if you've if you've nothing else to do, you could uh, slip along and uh, give that an audition. Um, we also, during the week, both myself and Alan, or Alan and I, to uh, put it uh, properly, we, we had a meeting with uh, a chap, a chap in relation to MMS. That's uh, uh, pioneered by Jim Humble. I'm sure anyone who hears MMS will immediately think of Jim Humble, and we probably are familiar with his work. So we actually hooked up with a chap there during the week, and we it was meant to be kind of a short meeting, but it ended it ended up at nearly oh I think the best part of three hours at least two and a half hours anyway. But uh, we we kind of refreshed what we already knew in relation to MMS. And uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Helen's just sliding over here. Um, 
we, we kind of refreshed what we already knew and we had a good chat about the MMS. We actually got some of the MMS and we've learned about it. We've, kinda, we, we've read a lot of uh, Jim Hummel's work. We've seen a lot of uh, information on the internet. But now that we're, af- we're actually after getting some of the MMS solution, uh, I'm, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of one of these people, and, and so is Alan, that we're, we're not, we wouldn't kind of promote something unless we've tried it first. So basically, that's that's what we're doing at the moment. We're, we're in, in in the process of just trying trying to stuff out, just to just to see what it's all about. I, I mean, I, I've been I've been using it myself uh, for the past, I'd say three four about four days, and uh, I haven't grown any new appendages, uh, not yet anyway. But I, I'll keep you I will keep you posted as to uh, what if anything happens. But I say we wouldn't kind of promote this stuff unless we force tried it so that's uh, that's where we are at the moment brilliant and I'll be getting some during the week we are now on the two players on TNS the fast player and the slow player if you want to um, hook up and use one of them players we are now up and running um, great uh, on the MMS side so yeah we'll be meeting um, uh, the chap during the week I'll be meeting the chap during the week and getting some MMS off him and uh, giving it a try like Steve and see how we get on now I think we're going to be called OAM being, well, we probably be called the date station. Because we tend to, we had a, a couple of listeners, thanks for the information guys, a couple of listeners sent in um, information which is quite important and uh, quite interesting. So again, we're just going to give you the information as it is. You don't have to believe what we say, go and research yourself and check it out, okay? Now, the first thing was um, that NASA is saying, um, NASA experts think that September 2012 solar storm could reduce America to a developing country. It says, scientists now believe the solar flare could change everything for our civilization as we know it today. Predictions are being made to the effect that a major solar storm is set to strike America and some parts of the world on September the 21st, 2012. Now, we, we knew about the solar storm and the prediction of the solar storm. Science has predicted this and we knew about it from a number of, of different um, areas. Uh, people have talked about it, the science has talked about it. So this is just another article that was raised saying the 21st of September. Now, I don't know how true that is. Again, it's another date. Uh, we also have John Moore going to be on our show in the next few weeks. And John Moore is talking about the third week in October for a lot of things that's going to be happening there, the October surprise. So, again, more dates for you there. So, Bear in mind, you know, check it out. Don't, you know, don't believe what we say. Go and check it out. But the third, John Moore is talking about, John's going to be on the show. He's talking about the third week in October when everything's going to go off. These people here are saying that the solar flare is looking on the 24th of September. And there is something else that we, we, we're going to be talking about shortly in a minute. But we just go over to Steve for Steve's week. How's your week, Steve? Uh, well, <laughs> when we were talking about the, the, the Stewart meeting and also the, the MMS, that, that was pretty much my week. Uh, that was that was kind of, that was the highlight of my week. The rest of it w- was just basically spent, um, kind of perusing perusing uh, my, some of the links you sent over. I wouldn't have watched all the links, but uh, a lot of the information that you sent over, I kind of just just kind of digesting that during the week, um, watching watching some videos um, on um, on basically MMS, because as I when we, when we met up the chat there during the week, I wanted to. Uh, I know I know we had, we had about two hours of him, but then I wanted to. Uh, Get more information, and um, I know like there's a lot of Jim Humble work online, so I was kind of checking that out as well, and uh, just kind of seeing seeing what, what 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 Jim was saying, what other people were saying as well, and um, that that's that was it. I mean, there was a lot of other other videos that I, that I, I was watching as well uh, in relation to you know various different things. I mean, I watched a, a, a nice little documentary there last night. I think it's only about I say forty forty minutes long uh, in relation to fluor- uh, the fluoride, the anti fluoride or the pro clean water whichever angle you want to view it from uh, I was watching a documentary on that and uh, it kind of had everything that everything that we need to, to explain to people but in bite sized chunks it was, it was like all the information kind of crammed into about 40 minutes and it was enough information that you could you'd hand it to someone and say watch that it'll take about maybe 40 minutes of your time and you'd be well clued in on the whole history of fluoride and also, you know, uh, the, the the bad effects of it as well. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of st- kind of touching base as well with some of the group that we 
we, we hooked up with a couple of weeks back. Um, some of the members from that group there, Terry, I was kind of uh, tic tacking with Terry. Tic tacking with Terry. That has a nice sound to it. Um, on Facebook, um, we're trying to organise. Uh, uh, Terry has. A, I never got to tell you this. Uh, Terry has sent me over some some files. They 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 got some t-shirts printed up and some flyers and big banners as well. They were kind of doing their thing down in Wexford, uh, re fluoride. And he was kind enough to. So I had a chat room last night on Facebook. He was kind enough to send me over some information and also the PNG files if we wanted to go and get some T-shirts knocked up. So yeah, that's that, that's my week. I'm, I'm I'm sorry, it's not more exciting. Um, how was your week? Um, well, just a few things that we go through. We obviously we uh, sorted out the the steward video and a few other things. Now, for those of you, I don't know whether anybody has come across the Illuminati clock. If you go on to YouTube, YouTube later on and type in Illuminata Clock, there's a website being set up. It's called www.luminataorders.info. And apparently, um, today is a very poignant day. And the clock was counting down to zero today. And it, it counted down to 1.23 and 33 seconds today. That's when it hit ground zero today. And I don't know why the clock is there. Nobody knows why the clock is there or why the website was set up. The website is very, very slow to load, by the way. Now, people might be saying, I'm, I'm sure people have said, oh, it's got to do with the Illuminata. But to be honest with you, with all the money they have, they could actually pick a better website because it, it loads very, very slow. It takes forever to load. And if that's who they hired to do the website, the Illuminata, they've, uh, they've, uh, <laughs> they've lost their money. You know, they should yeah, or get a refund at least because, you know, I mean, the graphics are okay, but the speed of the loaded website is terrible. But there was a countdown clock today. Apparently, this is the end of the Paralympics over in London. So, I don't know whether that countdown clock is something got to do with a tie-in to the solar flares and other predictions. I don't know. But it's just worth having a look at the website to see what they're doing and what it is and what, what they're saying. But I, I was having a look at the countdown clock today. It's quite, quite interesting. Now, the other thing that's obviously people are talking about is, for those of you who know about the Maya predictions and the Hopi Indians who are descendants of the Maya, the Hopi Indians talk about the Blue Star Kachina and then they say that's followed by the Red Star Kachina. And the Blue Star Kachina, and I know recently we had, not so long ago, a Blue Moon. Allegedly. Allegedly. I didn't Alleg- say it. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah, put, put your teeth in. Allegedly. I, I seen a moon that night. I, I, I didn't well, see, yeah, didn't well, seem. I didn't seem, it didn't, didn't seem blue. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway. It looked a little bit sad, but not blue. <laughs> well, apparently, I don't know whether it's a, an actual blue or whether it's some kind of um, just a, a statement that they made regarding some kind of atmospheric condition. But the blue star can chain that follows the red star. Of course, all these things are beginning to happen and people are talking about it and certain things are going on. Again, I don't know whether it's this info or whatever, but we just thought we'd mention it and put it out there just to say, um, just to let you know. Oh, just on that clock, by the way, in the descriptions in that Illuminata clock, the website says, Cyber Sanctuary of the Ancient Illuminated Series of Bavaria. That's what the description of the website um, was in the actual source code. So that's quite interesting. Now, um, we also got an email off a listener regarding a product down in Australia called Black Slav, S-A-L-V-E. Black Slav, not slave, Black Slav. And it's a composite herbal product that has been used for many years to treat a variety of ailments, including some forms of cancer. Never heard of it before. Just sent an email by one of our listeners in Australia. And thanks for letting us know about that. Uh, Quite interesting. Um, having a read of that we might put the link out next week and let you have a look at that and see what you think yourself so um, but that's really uh, the information that we uh, that we uh, have for you on a few bits and pieces going on so you know the next couple of months I do feel that there's, there's an awful, awful lot going on and you need to be I, th- I still think it'd be good having water and having food packed away and having heat because if anything does happen you know um I think it's important that you should have a backup. If nothing happens, you haven't lost anything. But it's better to have a backup, okay? So make sure you have your food in and you have your water in and stuff like that, just in case. Um, Right, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to get on with the interview. Now, when we did the interview, this is a pre-record, when we did the interview with Marcus, Marcus is a very soft speaker on the microphone, 
and he was um, so even though he was in front of the microphone he was very quiet so we had to enhance the audio so apologies for it's not the best audio in the world but we had to enhance it so you can hear him talking so hopefully you'll be able to hear if there's any issues let us know in the chat facility but for now we'll go over to Marcus and the interview and then we'll catch it on the far side catch it in a minute Okay, we'd like to introduce Marcus McKeown, who's an author and lecturer. Good evening, Marcus. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Good. It's great to be here. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks for coming on the show. We know it's a, a pre-record, but obviously we're very keen to get you on because well, um, I popped down to you last week and we had a little bit of a chat and I thought, this is, this is a guy that we can really have a great chat with on the radio show. And thanks again for giving, giving over um, a good few books to us that we can sell and obviously donations to OAM, which is fantastic. Um, we have passed out a few of the books to people um, and uh, the feedback has been fantastic, I have to say that. Even my own sister, she had a, a book, I gave it to her, and she kept ringing up saying, do you know what they're doing? Do you know what the banks are doing? Do you know what they're doing? So she's, because she's, she's, um, in a situation at the moment, let's just leave it at that. So the book came at the right time for her, you know. And um, tell us all about before we go into the pros and cons and mortgages and credit cards and all that stuff and the mindset needed. Tell us about Marcus McCune. Where did this all come from? Who was Marcus McCune? Oh, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> well, the life I've lived has been uh, death of your life with many different colours, many different shapes to it. I have been searching for many, many years uh, since I was very young to try and understand, you know, who am I, why am I here, what's this world all about. Uh, I grew up in a typical traditional Irish family. There was uh, an element of Catholic faith. There was an element of a society belief system that, that said you had to do certain things in a certain way. And for whatever reason, I guess just the cut of who I am, it just never made sense. It never encouraged me or enthused me to become a part of the system and I used to listen to my own parents talk about the um, the challenges of, of life and you know it took them 20 25 years to have what they had and it was a hard graft and I you know in fairness they were trying to help me understand that life isn't easy but on occasions I used to think geez that sounds miserable yeah and I don't want that I don't want to struggle I don't want to suffer you know so that and many things like it would cause me to look beyond what, what most people would look beyond and look outside the box, per se. Um, and I began to ask big questions, questions that many people couldn't answer. You know, why, why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going to? Uh, what is the, the reason behind my being the way I am, looking the way I do, being a certain height, being a certain build? You know, somebody mm. please give me an understanding. Now, the only frame of reference I had to search into the deeper things was and into you know, understanding if there is a bigger organization or an, or, an or, ordering force. You know, and, and I began to check it out in my own faith, which at the time was Catholic. Uh, I studied theology. I worked for the Catholic Church for three years uh, with young people, faith development and school retreats, which was an amazing, a powerful time, mm -hmm. powerful, amazing experience just to, to understand people at that level from the, from the searching perspective of yeah, faith. Yeah. You know? uh, obviously, and, and naturally, I guess, myself and the church part of company and theological differences of opinion. <laughs> okay. That's probably the nicest way to put it. Uh, but my search continued. And uh, I checked out Eastern philosophies. I checked out Eastern religions. I checked out different philosophical frames and references and whatnot. And as the years went by, I just began to form and create my own understanding according to what I was feeling as opposed to what I was thinking. And I realized that a lot of the, the faith journey, a lot of the religious journey I checked out heavily depended upon my thinking and not so much my feeling. Mm. Uh, and it seemed to be that the feeling had a lot more to offer mm. and had a lot more truth and authenticity. And the feelings don't lie. Mm. And as I followed the feelings, as I tracked the feelings, as I questioned them, I began to really experience something beyond what my mind could comprehend. Um, and it was just one piece at a time. You know, I'm 40 years of age. Mm. My journey began, my earliest memory of my journey began was 14. Uh, so that's what, 26 years ago? And at that stage I wrote a small book for my mother, which uh, at the time shocked the living daylights out of her. Um, but it was the story of why I chose her to be my mother before I was even conceived. Uh, and that's the earliest I remember. Now my parents would tell me long time before that I was asking big questions. My father used to dread me saying, Dad, I want to ask you something. Because it would often be questions that he'd look at my mother and say, Jesus, Mary, 
what do we do with this, you know? Mm. Um, but my life has been full of different colours. I have, uh, I was at one stage uh, a commercial pilot. Uh, I ran a couple of companies, coach training companies. I owned, I was a partner in, in two of them. Um, I was in sales for many years. Uh, I travelled a bit, you know, so there's a lot of different variations. But I guess for me, the underlying purpose and meaning of my life is to understand what purpose and meaning really are. Do, okay. they, do they exist? What do they mean? You know, why are there so many of us with different paths? How do we all get on? Or if we can't all get on, what do we do with that information? Right now in my life, I'm experiencing what I would describe as my dream. I live in a world where I'm stress-free, uh, anxiety-free, worry-free, which is a beautiful thing. I've gone through all of those things. Um, and I would consider myself heart, mind, soul and body to be experiencing a level of life, a level of existence that is truly a gift. Fantastic. And when you were growing up, just in your childhood, did you feel, did you, your, uh, your peers and the kids around you feel that, like, Marcus is a bit strange because of your thinking? Um, I don't know. I know in secondary school I was considered, I was called by many people the philosopher. Mm. You know, they'd laugh and say, here comes the philosopher. Because most of the questions I would ask would be a philosophical yeah. level of question as opposed to a, mm. a serious, factual, mathematical equation question. Mm. Um, I don't think anybody ever considered me strange. I, for a long time, Alan, I hid an awful lot of what was going on inside me. I was aware that I was thinking and asking things that, that weren't popular or common. So mm. a lot of what I hid, and I, I etched out and carved out certain friendships and relationships where I could express this and search for this and seek this. Yeah. But, but then I also had the dual reality, the other side of that coin, where I go out in the beer with the lads and I, you know, check out the mini skirts and, you know, not, just not, not want to be anything different. Yeah. Um, but I got to a point where I realized, okay, I'm, I'm different. There's a, there's a few people we've come across who said that to us, that even in school, instead of them just accepting the dogma that's normally churned out by the educational system, they've questioned it. Mm. And the teachers are looking at them saying, how dare you going to question me? You just have to garbage in, garbage out. Sure. You know, that's the way it is. Yeah, and for a lot of the teachers, I discovered, and looking back, and I've spoken to a lot of my school teachers in recent years, for a, uh, on a lot of occasions what happens there is that the teachers don't have the answers. They, they are trained in a syllabus, and they know the syllabus very well. But if you take them outside that syllabus, it's unknown territory. They don't know how to respond to interaction. Mm. And they're trained, certainly when I went to school, they were trained not to interact. It was more to dictate. Yeah. And the whole idea was for you to learn off by heart mm. and to answer questions in an exam with no book to reference. Mm. So I don't know what, what was really going on there. I do believe a lot of it was they just didn't have the training or the experience or the understanding that it was okay to check out something beyond the syllabus. Yeah, the uh, I find that that happened with my 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 son's school, where uh, an instant uh, occurred where just the teacher was very ignorant to him being open-minded, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, if this is the kind of education that they're teaching the kids to be, you know, just oh, we're going to give you this stuff, you just have to, you know, garbage in, garbage out, don't question it. Um, and don't open your mind to the possibility that there could be a diff different answer, sure. you know, which is very, you know, sure. well, very I'm concerning. I believe that school, for many, school is an apprenticeship, uh, and all it does is it teaches you how to go to work. Mm. Check in, check out, earn your money. Pay great your employees. Bills. Absolutely. It, it makes great employees. Yeah, sure. Okay, going down the road of, you know, the, the debt, um, the, the mortgages and the credit cards and all that kind of stuff. I think we all kind of reach that at different levels in our life when we come into debt and we have a, you know, we know the banking system. I mean, if, if people have to be asleep to see what's going on with the likes of Standard and Chartered and the, the, LIBOR, the LIBOR interest rate uh, scam that's going on with Barclays. I mean, the whole house of cards and the financial system, it's all coming out now and coming down and it's all being rigged and they're all linked to each other. The Light and Tush, I believe, apparently, allegedly, has been also fingered with the Standard Charter um, system. And um, this uh, scandal that's going on. Um, where did you, where do you come in on that? What happened to you to start waking up about the system? Well, interestingly enough, in all of my searching, I never really questioned the finance world. I questioned the religious world. I questioned the whole idea of God. Mm. I never questioned the legal world. I never questioned the, the financial world. Mm. And in 2008, uh, one of the companies I had in a two-week period got four phone calls pulling four big jobs that we had and I think I, I don't know at the time I think it was about 200,000 or 210,000 euro of business that disappeared in two weeks 
which effectively was the next three months overheads gone and I realized we're not going to there's, there's some things after changing we're not going to find that business again so quickly um, and as a result of that the company went down to 20 literally overnight mm. and I was happy enough to walk away I wasn't very material I was driven at certain levels by material yeah. things but I didn't depend upon it yeah. and I wasn't relying on it so I was easy enough to walk away but the questions in my mind began to haunt me you know where is the money where did that all go how can we be worth billions for 10 or 12 years literally billions that there's an endless amount of money been offered to anybody even people who have bad credit and all of a sudden within a week or two weeks that's gone it disappeared and I wanted to know where is it and then I began to ask well did it ever really exist mm. and that put me on the, the track of investigation and wanting to understand for no reason other than just to understand for myself so I could map out my past and understand karmically where I came from, where I'm going to, yeah. and what the lessons were. But at the same time, because I was in the coaching world, a lot of my clients were coming to me, and I was seeing a distinct change in what they were bringing to the coaching session. Before this, they were talking about achieving their dreams and their goals and personal development and spiritual understanding. And all of a sudden, now they're coming in and sitting down and saying, look, I need help. I don't know what to do. I've lost my job. I'm losing my job. My house is in negative equity. I can't afford the bills, etc. And for the first time ever, I began to think, I need to begin to learn what I can give that's practical and, and solid and not just have a philosophical conversation about personal development. Mm. So I began to read. I began to ask questions. I began to watch some of the amazing and famous DVD or um, YouTube uh, videos that are out there, Money Masters and things like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and I began to ask questions and I began to talk to the banks and I phoned, made some phone calls to the, the law society to find out how they work and I phoned the banking system to find out how they work and I'd ask questions looking for answers foolishly and naively thinking that they'd actually engage and they'd answer and yeah. I genuinely did I know, thought, yeah. well, yeah. I thought these are fair questions they're going to ask yeah, they're yeah, going to answer yeah, yeah. but of course the more I asked the, the shorter the phone calls came yeah. so I really began to dig deep and I began then out of sheer necessity with the numbers of people contacting me for help in desperate measures and at one stage I think one of the big changing points for me was a, a client well she wasn't a client at the time but I got a phone call at 20 past 8 one morning from someone to say look I need to bring my wife to see you it's urgent we're in the car can we just drop into you right now mm -hmm. and I knew in his voice there's a problem I said sure 40 minutes later she was sitting on the sofa in my living room and he explained to me that at 7 o'clock that morning he cut off my rope and she was just stressed out she just couldn't take it she felt like she couldn't go on she felt numb no more no meaning no understanding just lost and I really got to a place in myself where I said this isn't good enough mm. you know this is just not acceptable this you know one person doing that is enough and I was aware that she wasn't alone so I began to hold meetings on a Monday in City North Hotel uh, on the M1 uh, they were free of charge. When people wanted to leave a donation to help cover the cost of the room. That was fine. And did you cover... Did people were normally good to donate to help you cover the cost? Mm, on occasions. Yeah. On occasions. Yeah. But I didn't... I wasn't even thinking about that at the time. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I live in a world where what I need comes to me. Okay. You know, I live in the abundance of, of life. So what I need comes. So if we fall short, we pick it up and we find it somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but it did get to a point where there were that many people coming that we did cover the cost of the room and more. Okay, good. And, and the more allowed us to buy a sandwich and to cover the petrol. Yeah. Uh, which was good. It was nice to, to have yeah. that. So these meetings began. They began with 10, 12 people in a room. Three months later, there was 40 people in the room. Three months later, 60 people in the room. And then it kind of tipped out and averaged every Monday 70 to 80 people. And they were coming in with the same story, same stress, same anxiety. And they were all agreeing that something is wrong. This doesn't make sense. Mm. Something is not right. And I began to see an amazing awakening. There were no answers, but the questions were powerful. Yeah. Um, and those meetings helped a lot of people. If nothing else, it just gave hope. And I would always begin the meeting by saying, look, I'm going to tell you what I believe. This is my understanding of life. It doesn't mean it's the truth for you. It just means it's what I have discovered. Mm -hmm. You do with this information what you want and what you will, what you wish. And... Uh, we just continued to, every week I would learn something new, and that's what the meeting would be about next Monday. We'd say, look, here's what my research told me this week, and here's what I think you should do, and here's what I think you could do, and here's if you have the courage, here's what you can try. And it began to help a lot of people, 
and the more the meetings happened, the more I was almost forced to dig deeper in research because I was feeling a responsibility to have yeah. new information. Mm -hmm. So those meetings continued for probably eight, nine months, well, certainly the best part of a year, and then they stopped simply because I couldn't cope with the amount of phone calls. I was meeting people for coffees. I was coffeed out. I was literally going from one meeting to the next, and I was finding it very difficult to say no because people on the phone were genuinely saying to me, Marcus, it's I'm, hard, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I'm, I'm desperate. What, yeah. can I, what, what can I do? So um, I stopped the meetings, um, but I kept meeting individuals when they'd phone and they'd ask. And, um, and the interesting thing is, at the time the meetings were ending, there was a gentleman who came in for six Mondays in a row, sat down in the back, uh, well-dressed, nice guy, um, guy in, I, I assumed at the, mo at the time in his late 50s, and I began to get curious around him. I, you know, he, he stuck out for me. And I thought, this guy is, he's a somebody. I don't know what that means, but he's somebody. He's not here because he's in trouble. Um, and one day he, he pulled me up. He said, look, he said, will you meet me for a coffee? I want to talk to you privately. I said, sure. I met him for a coffee. And he explained to me that he was an ex-government minister. Uh, he sat in government as a minister, I think about 20 years ago. Uh, he was an ex-Lord Mayor of one of the big cities in, in the country, and he said, every week I come here, I jot notes. And the first thing I do in the car when I leave is I phone a solicitor, a barrister, or a banker that I know, and I ask their opinion on what you say. And every week, they say to me, sounds accurate, where are you getting the information from? And don't be a fool, don't go talking about it. So he said, I'm disgusted with the country, I'm disgusted with the way it's gone, and this information needs to go out. And he asked me, will I write a book? He said, I'll sponsor the book. I'll cover it. I'll commission you to write the book. So I said, sure, let's do it. It's a new way to hit the masses. So I spent a couple of months writing the book. It wasn't difficult to write. The book has a very entry-level lot of information, but it's important that we, we, we work at that level because most people don't even have that. Mm. Um, and the book went out. Interestingly enough, the day it went to print, the printer phoned me and said to me, Marcus, this guy just dropped. He told me he's not covering this today. When I got the print, I phoned him and I said, I'm ready to go. And he said, don't, don't print it. I'm not covering it. You'll have to talk to Marcus directly. And I haven't heard from him since. That was the end of it. The printer phoned me and he said, Marcus, what do I do? I said, what do you mean, what do you do? You're a printer. Print it. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Book ran. I didn't have the money to pay for it. But he didn't know that. And I was more concerned about getting it printed. Um, and I phoned a friend and I said, look, here's what's happened. What do we do? And the next day, that guy arrived at my door with the money to print the book, where six people, himself and five other people, put their hand in their pocket and covered it. And that was it. There was a number of thousand copies of the book went out. Most of them are gone. Uh, the feedback has been amazing. Uh, as soon as the book covered its own overheads, covered the cost of printing it, mm. and covered the cost of doing a tour around the country to promote the book, uh, I stopped charging. We started giving it out for donations, and if people had nothing, we give it for free. And this is the book... How, how the banks how the banks are screwing you and what you can do about it. Now, I've, now when we originally got in touch with you, um, one of the things that the authors do, a lot of authors that have come on our show, is they send us a copy of the book. We read it and then we review it because we can't endorse anything we don't read. Obviously, it makes sense. Sure. And, uh, uh, as, you know, um, uh, thanks to you, you sent over one of the books. I read it. And I have to say, I was very well impressed with the book. Very, very good. And people who've also read the book have come back and said... This book is brilliant. The information is fantastic. There was one person, though, and we said we'd talk about this on the show, and she had a general uh, question about it because she's been down this road before with previous books, and um, the question she has was, when we were talking about um, the financial system and feed currency and stuff like that, she come, she come out and said, well, hang on a minute, you're saying that it's fractional reserve banking and it's fiat currency and it doesn't exist. What about the house you live in? When you've got a mortgage, you have a tangible asset here. Mm. You know, well, it's a liability because until you pay for it, it's, it's, it's a liability. When you pay for it, it's an asset. Um, and she said, but that, that's bricks and mortar. So surely that, you know, um, that money paid for the house. Mm -hmm. So, and I said, well, I'm sure I could answer that, but I think I'll leave it to Marcus to answer that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And a lot of people have said this to me in the meetings. They said, but Marcus, look, I, what you're talking, the concept that you're delivering is wonderful. However, I have a real tangible something. And something had to pay for it. And the answer is simple, yes. Something did pay for it. That something exists in an illusion. 
But if you believe it's real enough, that reality that you create allows the transaction to happen. But I began to explain in very simple terms what really happens and what, is it, what it is that pays for the, the, the tangible bricks and mortar. And this, when I discovered this, it was so simple, it blew me away. And I went straight into the banks. I spoke to bank managers, I spoke to finance experts, I spoke to TV personalities who are in the world of economics, and they all just laughed and said, yep, you're right. So here's how it works. Okay. I sign, um, I sign a form, a loan application. That loan application very quickly becomes what's known as a promissory note, or a promissory note as I call it. That promissory note gets lodged into the banking system. The same way I would lodge 50 euro into the bank. As soon as the 50 euro is lodged, the bank record shows there is now 50 euro more than there was before the lodgement happened. And just, just to explain what you mean by the 50 euro, if, every, if you look at, like, especially the English notes, mm -hmm. it says we promise to pay the bearer. Mm -hmm. So English, well, even Irish notes, they're all promissory notes. They're mm -hmm. not, they don't have any value. It's only a piece of paper with sure. fancy print on it. Sure. Well, interestingly enough, just for the fun of it, last week I went into a bank in Newry with £20, which still has... We owe the bearer. Promise to pay the yeah. bearer, yeah. And I gave it to the counter and I said, there you go, I'm here to exchange this for my silver, please. And well, you should have seen the kerfuffle. <laughs> <laughs> it, was just, it was just funny to watch. Yeah. It was just funny to watch. Now, I, obviously, I left 20 minutes later with my 20 pounds in my pocket, you know, yeah. because it's just, it's just such an illusion. It's ridiculous. Mm. Now, the reality is that I have the legal right to go in and, and, and a lawful right to go in and say, I want silver. Yeah. Or gold. Yeah. Whatever it is you've got, I want it. Yeah. I don't want this note. I want its real value. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. But anyway, um, so what happens with this promissory note is it gets lodged. Yeah. And it gets lodged into the banking system. And as soon as it's lodged, the bank then has in an account on a computer screen the equivalent of the number written in the promissory note. Mm -hmm. So I sign a form for €300,000. That gets lodged, and the bank then shows that they have €300,000 more. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that the lodgement of your promissory note creates money. And a promissory note is a promise to pay. Absolutely. So that promissory note gets lodged. Now, if, what, what, how I began to discover this was I asked a bank, a senior bank director, can you explain to me what the asset is? Because all I knew was that my house was an asset. That's what I understood at the time. Mm. And I said, how can my house be your asset? And he said, well, it's, it's our asset because we loaned the money. And I said, but according to the Land Registry Office portfolio, it says very clearly this property is the sole ownership of Mr. Marcus McKeown. Mm. How can my property be your asset? And he hemmed and he hawed and he panicked. He came away, we were red-faced. And I knew by that I was going down a road that was uncomfortable for him. So I said, oh, I don't believe that the house is the asset. So can you now explain what is the asset? And he wouldn't answer. He couldn't and he wouldn't. So let's go back to the, the story. The promise note gets lodged, the money gets created. We now know that that is in an asset book, that transaction. Something becomes an asset. Yeah. Now, in the world of finance and balancing books, even basic accountancy in secondary school tells you that at the end of the day, there needs to be a double line under all the columns. They need to reconcile. There needs to be a balance. So you can't have one account or one bank column that says there's 300,000 unless there's another 300,000 in a liability column to cancel it out. So the asset that is 300 grand says we now have 300,000. But they're making the assumption that you will be paying this money back as a promise. Of course, yeah. of course. And their asset book claims we have this money. It's ours. Even though they don't. Absolutely. But on their book but it, on their book yeah, it yeah, says yeah. because of the game that's been played. Yeah. Now, what needs to happen under financial regulation is that the other column has to be complete. So the 300,000 goes into it. So now all I know is that they have 300,000, and the liability column says, we owe 300,000. And I wanted to know, well, who do you owe it to? You must owe it to somebody. And I realized, and I got this confirmed at a senior level in a bank, the day your solicitor gets the check, that is the balance of the loan being paid. What loan? The loan that you made to the bank, the loan of the 300,000 you gave to the bank when you created the money and left it in their account. Okay, let's, let's understand that. So when the sister gets the check off the bank, which is the 300,000, yeah. you're saying that that's when the debt is paid? Absolutely. That is the bank repaying the loan. Now, we think that we borrow the money. What we now know is that we create the money, it's our money, 
and as Father Ted would say, it's resting in their account. Right. Okay. Right? Yeah. So my 300,000 euro is in the bank's account, even though the 300 grand doesn't exist. We'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. The computer screen claims that there is 300,000, and that was mine because I created it. Yeah. Their liability column states that we owe it. Now, who do they owe it to? If you ask what the intention of a loan in the bank is, the intention is that he or she or it that provides the capital must be repaid the capital. So I asked the bank, a senior bank manager, is it true that whoever provides the capital must get repaid the capital? And he got excited and he rang like a dog. And he said, yes, 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 whoever gives the capital must get repaid it. And I said, well, then I don't owe you anything because I provided the capital for the loan. I created the money and gave it to the bank. And the day the bank gave the cheque to my solicitor, the bank settled that debt. Mm. So I didn't borrow money. You did. Now, we all know that it's not about the 300000 That's fractional yeah. banking. We'll come to that it, in a moment. Yeah. But, okay. but in very simple terms, I create the money. It sits in the bank account. The bank gives the money to my solicitor. The debt is cleared. So what bought the house? The money that I created. Or the... The illusion. Like, let's just assume yeah. that the money was real okay. for a moment. The money I created was used to buy the property. Yeah. So was the property bought? Yes. Did money buy it? Well, yes. Whose money was it? It was mine. And the bank stay within the legal reality and the lawful reality by giving back the provider of the capital, the capital that was used to make the purchase and create the loan, which is Marcus McKeown. Or in your case, your loan. Yeah. You create the money, you lend it to the bank, they repay it to you via your solicitor. And that money then buys the property. Now, the amazing thing is that the money doesn't really exist. Mm. It looks like it exists because there's a computer screen that says it exists. Yeah. We foolishly, stupidly, actually have accepted that because the computer screen says it's real, it must be real. Now, that's about as foolish as believing because the Irish Times or the Independent says that it must be there for real, or the Sunday World say it, therefore it must be real. It's ridiculous. Mm. It doesn't mean it's real. It just means that that's a claim. So when you ask questions around the claim that they're making, you realize that there is no money. But the power of the illusion is incredible. Here's what happens. I fill in a form. It goes into a bank, and a computer says for 300 grand. They write a check and give it to the solicitor. Now, what does the solicitor do with the check? He gives it to the auctioneer, and the auctioneer puts it back in the bank. So the illusion is 300 grand existed, mm. but no 300 grand ever had to exist because a piece of paper was passed around and just yeah. sent back into the place it came from. So, it's a, well, banking is a big bookkeeping exercise sure. anyway, and it's all about balancing the books. So, it, it, as you say, it's an illusion. Once they can balance the books between the banks and all the banks are involved in this bookkeeping exercise, mm -hmm. then everybody's happy. Sure. So the banks have been technically paid twice because that means that if you've created the money, the 300000 and then you give it to your solicitor, which means that's paid, mm. then the bank come after you for 300000 They're getting 600000 technically. Well, <laughs> actually, and I don't know the exact figures, but it seems to be that for every 200,000, and I'm using 200 because I can calculate even numbers. Okay, <laughs> I like even numbers too, yeah. For every 200,000 euro that the bank allegedly loan, they collect back between 2 and 5 million. That's and incredible. Literally. And, literally. And obviously, it's, um, the banks are not allowed legally to give their money. So when they're dealing with fractional reserve banking, they're dealing with depositors' money. Sure. And they're fractionalizing oh, that. Oh, and, and I asked this question in the bank. Mm. I, I eyeballed a guy in the bank and I said, can you explain to me, is it proper, legal and lawful that you can take a deposit from somebody else and use it to lend me money without asking them? Can you take their money and give mm. it to me without their permission? And I got no answer. Mm. I, I, the guy froze solid. Mm. And I've asked 60, 70 different questions along those lines, mm. and I have yet to get an answer. Mm. So, you know, when you say the bank effectively get twice the money back, they get an awful lot more than that. Yeah. For a number, and, and in particular since the downturn, like there are five or six very obvious ways to get paid. One, they come after you for the money, and you repay it in incrementally yeah. over 20 years. They put an interest on it. Uh, secondly, they get a bailout. Now, if you think of it, what happened with the bailout, and in the book there's a quote from the Minister for Finance, and I wrote and I lodged, I think it was 126 or 162, I can't remember, 100 plus questions in the doll, 
very few of which were answered, but the ones that were answered just blew me away, blew my socks off. So um, this bailout, and I'll explain what he said in, in a moment, but this bailout, effectively what happens is we all borrow money, even though we know we didn't. Let's pretend that the money is real for now. We yeah. all borrow this money, and the bank end up in trouble with a big hole, yeah. a big hole of debt, mm. and they get a bailout, which if you visualise the bailout being a hole in the ground, and a dump truck comes filled with clay, and it tips it into the hole. The mm. hole no longer exists. Mm. All the debt's gone. Mm. The hole is gone because the dump truck filled it. So the banks got repaid in advance for all of the debt, and they're still coming after you and me, and they're still putting an interest in it. Not only that, but a lot of the debt, alleged debt that they have, is insured. Exactly. So it's cleared off with an insurance policy. Yeah. So in some cases, they come after you and me for the money. Now, they claim if they get an insurance payoff, and they still get money off you, they have to inform the insurance company and repay it. Like, hello? Yeah. You know, come on. You're we're not stupid enough to believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. So they're getting paid it by you paying it. They're getting paid with the bailout. They're getting paid with the insurance policy. And, and the list goes on. There are three or four or five other ways in which they're getting paid. And then on top of that, they drop this money into the fractional reserve banking system, which means very simply that for every hundred euro they lend out, they can lend another, I think it's 900. I think yeah. nine or ten times yeah. that value can be loaned. One to nine, you know, one to ten, yeah. you know. So for every yeah. euro that they claim is real, they can lend out ten times that. Yeah. that. That isn't real, and it doesn't need to be real, and that's called fiat money. So what we yeah. do know is that they play with what's known as fiat money, which is money that exists on the computer screen but doesn't exist in reality. Yeah. So they're just getting paid time and time and time again, and they take your promissory note, and they bundle it together with four or five or six or ten thousand other ones, and they sell it on the market as a bond. So someone comes along, mm -hmm. buys this, some guy in the States comes along on Wall Street and buys it. Um, it, it might be a maturity value of two billion, he buys it for half a million, mm -hmm. and then he sells it that evening to China, and mm -hmm. China sells it that evening to Canada, and Canada sells it that evening to Japan. Mm -hmm. And the average loan is sold two, three, four hundred times. Well, what you're talking about are SPVs, which mm -hmm. are special performance vehicles, which the banks, they, they get the number of houses and then they will sell on them. So uh, a financial guy told me um, not so long ago, he said, within the first five years, your mortgage is sold 65 times. Yeah, well, I was told over 200 times. Wow. So I don't know what the truth is. All I yeah. know is it's bloody well sold many times, yeah. and they're making a fortune on it. Now, not only that, when you default on your payment, They've been paid with the bailout, they've been paid on insurance policy, they get a tax right off on the fact that you've defaulted, which is an incredible amount of money that they get as well. Mm. And on top of that then, they continue chasing you for the money, they take your home off you, they sell it to somebody else so they get the money for it there, and then they mortgage the person who's buying it. Mm. So they're right back into the system. So there's already mm. four, five, six ways in which they're making money. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be real money. Because we are still asleep mm. and believing that the money exists. Yeah. So they don't care whether it's real or it's not once we remain numb yeah. and dumb and anaesthetized to the point that we continue to play the game. And this is the whole thing. I mean, I think they said only 3% of physical money is in circulation. 97% yep. is on computer. Doesn't exist. And as long as we... You know, believe that that piece of paper in our pocket, I mean, as you say, look at the signature that's on the euro note. I mean, I can't make it out. Do you have a name for that? Did you see? No. Um, somebody said, was it? Joe. Yeah, someone said it was Joe. Joe, yeah. <laughs> Joe. Somebody said it was Joe. Looks like Joe on, on the euro note, yeah? But if you look at... Who's Joe? Who's Joe? Well, I don't know. Somebody, somebody in Europe. Somebody yeah. signed it in Europe. Yeah. And uh, if you look at uh, the euro note, this is our perception. And this is what I was saying to a neighbour of mine. I was talking to her and said, look... A cup, an empty cup, as long as we agree that that has a value, then that's fair enough. Sure. And that's what we've done. We've put a value on these pieces of paper with this funny print on it, mm -hmm. and we all accept this for value, which is exactly how the financial system started with the IOUs. Yeah. So I said, when the system collapses and we realize when they pull the plug, that's not going to be worth anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, and the typical ex example is Botswana, where you have trillion dollar notes, and they're not worth anything. <laughs> trillion dollar notes. I don't know whether you've seen them. They're massive. Trillion dollar notes. And there was a, I heard a story, I don't know how true it was. There's a guy that had all the notes in the wheelbarrow. He got mugged. They took the wheelbarrow and left all the notes there. Because the real world was worth more than the money. And one of these chefs went over. 
to uh, Botswana, you know, one of these Gordon Ramsay chefs went over and he was buying fruit in the market and he wanted to buy an apple or something like that and he takes out this wad of cash just for the apple. So on, I went on to Google for some, you know, for a bit of fun to see what the value would be compared to one euro. And it's just, like, ridiculous. You're walking out yeah. with lots of cash. But the, the problem with the um, the financial system and the fraction reserve, I mean, we, we've been dealing with people and talking to people about this. Financially, if you do the maths, we've reached the end of this system. It yeah. doesn't work. You know, because the interest... You know, if uh, I think we said about this, you I think you have an analogy. If there was only a thousand pound in the world, mm-hmm. do you want to do that analogy? Yeah, I think it, I think this comes from the book where I was trying to explain in as simple a terms as possible to get people to understand that that this is a game, and if you don't realise this, you're going to end up staying the rest of your life stuck in it. So, mm-hmm. I think the analogy is that if there was only a thousand pounds or a thousand euro, whatever the case might be, yet there is owed two or three or four thousand. The only way we can clear that debt is to print more money, which as soon as it leaves the conveyor belt is sold at a price which creates more debt. Mm. So we have to wake up and realize that it is literally impossible to clear debt unless we begin to create this illusionary rubbish money Mm. with no interest. Then a point will come when we can actually do it. But if you do that, you kill the game. You kill the game for the people who are behind the game and the people who are benefiting from the game. And I I think what we need to do is, like this. for me, this whole thing goes beyond trying to beat the bank. It goes beyond trying to beat the legal system. Like I've been in court more times in the last two years than I've had hot dinners, uh, supporting people, doing McKenzie friend for people, observing... And I have very quickly realized that that this is not going to be won in the court system. There will be small wins, but as soon as a win becomes close enough to the big win that we require, the law changes. Mm. They shift the goalposts, or they just ignore the points of law we bring up. They literally ignore it. Like, we had a number of cases where we were sure we had something. We We were sure we had it won. And at one stage, we put the argument up that the money doesn't exist. We put the argument up that the court system, or the the banking system, uh, had committed fraud. And the judge looked at the piece of paper we gave him and he said, I don't understand this. And he literally threw it off his table onto the floor and said, I don't get that. I don't understand that. That's irrelevant. Now, and he can't say that. The judge well, cannot say that. Well, let's, let's get something fairly clear here. He can, and he did. He may, it may not be legal nor lawful. Yeah. It may not be right. Well, that's what I mean. But the yeah. reality yeah. is that he can, mm. and he did. Mm. And this is why the system wins. Because they do what we believe they can't. And we have yet to wake up and realize that anything is possible. They can do whatever they want. But what is that? Only a mirror for us to realize, so can we. Yeah. So can we. We can change the rule book. We can live by a different set of rules. And of course, we, you know, we can talk a little bit about the whole legal system and what that's really all about, and it's a trust, and it's, all, you know, it's based on canon law and all that kind of stuff. But you know, there's even a part of me that believes that maybe we're at a point where that just becomes irrelevant. Mm. Maybe we just need to sit back and realize that, you know what, let's screw all the detail. Let's screw trying to beat this. Let's just stop engaging. Let's just stop giving it. Let's stop feeding it. Mm. Let's start to live differently so we disempower the entire system that is crippling us. So what we end up with is a new, even if it's chaotic, it's a new possibility, a new potential that we have the capacity to continue to mould and to craft Mm. and to to etch out. So, like, I know there's a lot of great people out there doing a lot of great things. Mm. Unfortunately, they're doing these great things against a system that is designed not to be beaten. And we need to realise that. We need to wake up and realise the system is not to be beaten. It can only be eradicated. It can only be changed. It can't be beaten. And you don't change it by, by trying to persuade the people in it to see what you see. Mm. And this is where this whole thing becomes very deep, you know, and more than just a surface level conversation. There are people in this world and their role is to play the opposite. Mm. The, the people play the, the, the side of the light, people play the side of the darkness. So it's the nature of the beast of the system and the nature of the beast within the system mm. to be true to what they know is their role. And their role is never to let you shine your light into their, into their reality. So whatever's needed to continue to change it. So there needs to be some awakening of the true nature of who we are and a true understanding of who we are and let that feed what it is that we do and how it is we do it and why it is we do it. Um, Now in the meantime we have to continue playing ball. We have to go into the court, we have to try and tackle little wins here and there in order to continue the process of waking people up. 
Uh, and it's teaching us a lot. Like at the moment, there are so many lay litigants in Ireland. It's phenomenal. The court system hate lay litigants. Hate them. And there's dozens and dozens every day standing up to defend themselves. And that's telling us that we are beginning to wake up and realize we can do it ourselves. Mm. And we can disconnect from the system that is simply there to feed itself. One of the questions that somebody asked me the other day, and you might be able to clarify this, or if I'm right, um, and I go down to the local district courts all the time, and when you get somebody going up to the judge, um, could be for a speeding fine, whatever, and the judge says, uh, do you have a solicitor? And the guy says, oh, the gay woman might say, no, I don't. And he'll go, he'll get one of these legal um, uh, judges and say, look, can you represent him? Mm-hmm. Now, what I was told, I don't know how true this is, is that they do that because they don't know how to deal with people when they ask questions that's not part of the game. See, solicitors are, are in the game, and they know how to talk to the judge, and the judge, the judge knows how to talk to them. But when you get the lay people going in who don't know the system, and the judge gets a bit kind of, I don't know what, to, if he asks me something that is not part of the game, you know, that, so that's one of the things I heard yeah, was that that's why you do this yeah, because that's why you have more, a bar yeah. you know them and us yeah the, the, there's, there's more to that reason I had um, myself and Dominic who, who travelled with me down the road of this for a couple of years uh, had a, an amazing meeting with a judge in his home um, we just happened to meet someone who, who said look I'll, I'll talk with you come to my home so I did what <laughs> what I thought would be helpful I went to his home with a bottle of wine and I thought if we can get him to drink a few glasses of that he might talk uh, it didn't take long to realise these guys can hold a drink and they can hold it well. Um, but we, we cracked open the bottle. We had a glass of wine. We chatted, and I asked him some. I asked him some very in-your-face, blatant questions, and and I asked him about the whole Lilithican thing. And he said, "Well, he said, I couldn't believe he told me this. He said, I'm going to give you a bit of advice. If you're going to tackle the court system, do it with no solicitor." I said, "Why?" He said, "Because if you go with a solicitor, you're screwed." You have more of a chance as a lay litigant than a solicitor. Although I don't believe you have much of a chance anyway, you have more of a chance as a lay litigant. And I said, why? And he said, because there is a legal and a lawful um, uh, onus on the judge to identify that a lay litigant may not know what they're doing, and he must therefore in some way support you and help you. And they don't want to support you and help you because they're supposed to be um, independent. Mm. But they must identify that if this guy isn't fully sure of what he's doing, due process may be prevented. And we're here really to support due process. So he said, if you go in as a lay litigant, the chances are the judge will find a way around you. But at some level, he or she must be aware that that if you are obviously going down a bum steer, they have to help you get that right. So he said, off the record, I'm telling you, don't go in with legal counsel. And he said, if you do know people going in with legal counsel, make sure, for example, barristers are not well-known or highly paid barristers, because the first thing he'll think is, this fracker can afford a barrister, he hasn't got a money problem. Hmm. So, you know, that judge told us some amazing stuff. Like, it was shocking, you know. Like, I asked him, you know, naively, I said to him, look, can you please help me to understand, as as a free man in this country, do I not have a right to stand up and scream no more? And he laughed. And he said, Marcus, the first thing you need to realize is that you're not free. And he said, that's a fool, thinks he's a free man. He said, even in legal terms, you're not free to the point that the law doesn't even need to give you the name of your mother and father if you don't know who they are. You're not free. And the legal system isn't there to tell you you're free. He also explained that one of the biggest issues and one of the biggest problems that we are experiencing at the moment when we go in as lay litigants is that we assume that ethics and integrity and fair play are a part of the legal system. And he said they're not. Ethics, integrity, fair play has no part in a court, a room as known as a court. He said the court system is there only to defend the law. The law is that thing that is in writing in the book in front of you. So what we do is we play the rules according to what's in that book. And if it's not in that book, or if that book seems unfair, he said irrelevant. We play the game according to what's in that book. So he said you need to know what it is that you're talking about when you go in according to what's in that book. He said the problem is that you'll always meet people in the court and judges who know more about that book than you do. Mm. And if you catch them, and if you catch them out and they don't know what to do, they have the right to reserve judgment. And they postpone the case, or they put the case off for a week or two weeks, and they phone up all their lads. 
all the cronies and all the barristers and all the solicitors and all the judges, and they say, look, what do I do? They all go to work like little ants, like little work ants and little work horses, and they get the answer. They come back and say, here's your way out. He calls the case back in, and he's got an answer. So he said, you need to realize that the system's not going to let you win. Uh, and he said, I'll be honest with you, the way you're asking me questions, if you come into my court with the attitude you have here tonight, you would bristle me, and I would put you in contempt. Because he said, I would not want you challenging my authority. And I said, wait, I said, this, you've got to be joking me. I said, you, are you telling me that as an Irish man, as, a, as, a, as a, a child of the land of Ireland, that you will defend the law, even if there is a chance that I am right, you will defend the law and show that I am wrong? And he said, absolutely. It's all about the law. It's not about right and it's not about wrong. Mm. And he said, that's where you keep getting this conversation off track. You keep going back to right and wrong. And what he, what he spoke about was actually in the spiritual world, it's a powerful, in the world of philosophy, in the world of theology, in the world of understanding who we are and the different realms of existence, he was speaking a powerful truth. There is no right and wrong. There is none in the world mm. other than what we label as right or wrong. And, and these guys know that. These guys have the power of the sorcery. They, they understand the rules beyond the human dimension. They understand the nature of the human being. They understand the nature of the spiritual being. They understand the emotion. They understand that we, the traps that we get caught up in. And they just sit back behind in their big throne, behind their protective desk or their protective bar, and, and they just play the game. And, and that, that's what it is. It is a game. game. It's it is only a game. a game. And that's what sets you free, the realization that this is a game. However, when you realize there, that this is a game, there is an enormous consequence. And the consequence is that if you choose, you have to choose, I'm either going to play the game or I'm not going to play the game. And for me, the consequence, which actually happen, happened to become one of the best things that ever happened in my life, I, I stopped three years ago paying my mortgage, credit cards, loans, overdrafts, finance on my car. I just stopped everything. Now, that was because I chose I'm no longer playing the game. Now, the consequence was... I had to leave the game in its entirety, not just some of the game. Now that meant that I had to go about my life and go about my business and go about my coaching world and my, my motivation world and my personal development teaching world and the healing that I do with no charge. You see, I would be a hypocrite to say, I'm not playing your game, but for you to come to me and say, that could be a thousand euro, please. Mm -hmm. So I was confronted with a real level of truth and a real challenge that Marcus you are either going to stand up and say I'm out of the game or you are going to be a hypocrite yeah so I stopped charging I started working for donation at the same time I spoke with my wife and she said okay I'll do the same we're one we're a unit we, we need to row this boat together so so we stopped charging and that's where a lot of people get into trouble with this they understand it's a game they're willing and happy to go down the road of banging the drum and sending out the drum beat to let the world know it's a game don't engage yet they're still charging Mm. and yet they're still depending upon the, the rules of the game that they're now claiming is an illusion. And there is an enormous challenge for all of us to ask the question, am I really going to allow myself to step out of this game, or am I going to half-heartedly move in between the, sh the shades and the shadows and, and still grab what I can, when I can, where I can. And that's where this becomes very hard for people. How does that work for you regarding, you now you, you talked about your mortgage and your credit cards and stuff, there's also the other side of the coin regarding, you know, travelling. And we say, you know, in the Constitution that we are allowed to travel and toll roads. And I, I know this is kind of getting, you know, kind of not so much picky, but this is a biggie in what we're, what we're told. And yeah. people come on our show and tell us about, you know, uh, contracts and parking tickets and... Um, fines and you know road tax and all this kind of stuff what's your take on that i mean where are you on that i mean one thing you said to me and i i, I kind of i i agree with you in a way because what you were saying i think when you said it was about taking responsibility and when i said to you when i met you i said what about the likes of parking tickets and you said just make sure you park somewhere where you just, won't get a ticket just park somewhere where you're not going why to bring that energy Absolutely. into your life yeah. Yeah. when you don't need it. Yeah, and there are people out there, unfortunately, who <laughs> claim to be a part of the, the, the wave of awakening and the, the enlightenment and all this kind of talk, and they go looking for places to park where they can challenge the parking fight. 
And I think, now, why, what kind of karma do you want to create? You are opening a portal energetically, and you are asking confrontation to come into your world. Mm. Yet you sit with me and say you want peace. Mm. Well, if you want peace, act peacefully. Mm. If you want peace, do, do unto others as you would have done unto you, even if they are a part of the system. So, so, if you, so if you say, accidentally, you come back from your car and your ticket or whatever it is, just some, some reason why you have a parking ticket on your car pay and it. you know, pay it. you just pay it anyway. Pay it. I, I, did, I went down the road of challenging all this a number of years back in my naivety when I entered into this whole mindset. And it was just so much bloody annoyance. I got a parking ticket in Navin. It was a 40 euro parking ticket. I spent 65 euro on registered post over and back to the county council. You know, and it just went on and on and on. And I just thought, now, what am I doing? What is this about? This is counterproductive. I don't agree with the parking ticket system. I don't agree with limiting parking areas. They're saying, you know, it's there for a reason, whatever, who cares. I don't agree with the system. But it's there. It's there. And if I'm going to store up the energy of my life to go to battle, I'm going to make damn sure it's a battle worth having mm. and worth dying for. And a 40 euro parking ticket is not worth leaking energy for. Mm. It's certainly not worth dying for. So I just pay it. Um, and, and, I, and I say to people who ask, I say, look, you make up your mind. You decide. Mm. There's no right or wrong. But for me, it's about choose the path of least resistance without compromising your values mm. and without compromising your ethics and without compromising your integrity. So even, you, even though you know the system is corrupt yeah. and what they're doing is, I won't say illegal, but in their system, I mean, the likes of parking tickets and TV licenses and all that, even though you know they're, we, we know they're wrong and acts and statutes and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, what you're saying is, look, if you're going to get into conflict, Get, get into conflict with something that's going to happen in your yeah. life that comes to you. Absolutely. Don't go to it and Absolutely. create conflict. Wait till it comes to you and then deal with it. You better believe it. That's it. And, and even more than that, even go to the next level above that and realize that you can say no to all conflict. Like, I, I am in the midst of, of the world of challenge in the banks. Most of my challenges are, are sorted. They're gone. Everything mostly is gone. But I, I never had to really go into conflict because I did it peacefully. I did it through communication. I did it through asking questions and using logic and critical thinking and, and more powerful questions. Now, I have the advantage of being trained as a coach, uh, and, and I'm a coach trainer, and I'm what they call at a European level a master coach. Now, I don't go into the, 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 the names or the terminology, but that's, the system would call me a master coach. And I have trained over a 1,000 coaches. So I'm well familiar with how to ask questions, how to use emotion, how to create empathy, how to build rapport, and how to navigate the com high level of powerful conversation. And I just used that. I just asked questions. Mm. I, and I said, well, that's okay. Thank you for that answer. Now, this answer has given me five more questions, and here they are. And that's how I learned. And I realized that, that when I was not in fear, because the only currency a bank have is fear. The only currency a legal system have is fear. The bank used the fear of, we'll take off you what you have if you don't give us what we want. The legal system say, we'll send you to jail if you don't give us what we want. Now, if their currency is fear, and you become fearless, we know that fear must still exist. So where is the fear? They have it. And when they're in fear, they don't know what to do, they don't have a box to tick, they don't have training or understanding how to deal with the fearless man or woman, so they eventually write you off. Mm. Because when Marcus McKeown goes into the bank and challenges them, I become hard work. Literally, I become yeah. hard work for the bank. And they sit back and they look at the pile of idiots, mm. as they would see them, the sleeping sheeple, mm. and they say, look, you know what, it's easier to chase these 400 people we get a lot more off them. This fellow's going to tie us up. He's going to delay us. He's going to annoy us. And God forbid, he might actually discover something that we don't want him to discover. And he may actually be able to teach this to other people. And then we'll have 40 of him instead of just one. So instead of sending him a letter saying, Mr. McKeown, thank you for the learning. And thank you for the challenge. And thank you for the insight. Your debt's now gone. They just leave you hanging. They just do nothing. And to me, that's success. It's gone away. So do you not think that down the line... Is, is there not somewhere in the, in the system where after like 10 years or something, if you're not pursued, then it's actually yeah, gone? I don't know what the term is. I think um, I think six years, but, six I, but years. I, I could be mistaken. Six or seven years. I maybe, think yeah. six years of, of no doing it, that, that there is some kind of an implication that therefore it gets written off. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, now, I don't believe that they will leave me. Like, they might have a year or two right to me, and, and, and there you go, you start again. Yeah. But I don't care. Let them do what they want. Yeah. You know, it doesn't bother and me. And what happens if down the line, you know, you're dealing with your house at the moment, that you want to sell your house? I never want to sell the house, and I'll tell you why. That house, if I ever do anything with that house, it'll be one of two things. I will win legally, and it will get written off, or I'll throw the keys back. And the likelihood is I'll throw the keys back. Because I don't see that I would allow myself to take on the unnecessary emotional, psychological, spiritual and physical battle of fighting them. They're not worth it. Mm. And as long as I'm invested in fighting them continually, I'm not invested in loving my life and loving my wife and loving the time we have together. Yeah. Because the time I could have with her is spent fighting someone I don't even know. Mm. So I'm not going to do that. I will challenge it within reason. I'll challenge it with the energy that I choose to dedicate to that battle, mm. but not announce more. And, and I don't need to sell or worry about selling or think about selling, and nor will I ever, I don't think it will ever become a reality because the house was bought for 338000 The mortgage with the debt and the repayments that haven't been made is now about 360000 and the house is valued and told at 90000 So it's just never going to happen. It's never going to happen. So why, why would I challenge that? Why would I fight it? Steve. Uh, yeah, I'm so, I am here. It's I am Steve. here. I just let the listeners know Steve is actually in the room. I am actually He's very quiet. Yeah. No, I've been fascinated with the information that uh, that Max has given us here. It's absolutely mind blowing information. And I'm kind of to say I'm sitting here with my jaw open on the ground is an understatement. I was kind of surprised, Mar uh, Marcus, to hear you saying that we're n we we think that we're we're free men, but uh, technically we're not free. And I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that. But you, you also said that you're kind of waking up process started when you were four, around 14 years of age mm -hmm. and, and that's uh, you said 26 years ago for the average man on the street to let's say he's finding he's having some difficulties now for him to challenge and uh, take control of his life as you as you're describing uh, how can he do it? I mean I know you, it's it's taken you 26 years to obviously get to, the, to where you are now well, is there kind of a fast way or maybe little golden nuggets of information or, you know, kind of it like a cheat sheet that the regular man on the street can do to kind of, say, fast track any problems that they might be having in the short term? Yep, there certainly is. And, and let me clarify, too, after 26 years of doing what I do and learning what I've learned, I'm still not there. I'm still on that journey. Yeah. I don't believe it will ever end. I don't want it to end. I love the learning. I love the enlightenment. I love the humility. I love the being knocked back into my own heart. And, and been knocked out of my own head. So I'm not there. I just happen to be at a certain point of the journey further than I was a number of years back. Um, so here's what I do when people come and sit with me. I ask some really relevant and important questions. I ask them, what do you want? What do you want your life experience from here on to be? What do you want to see when you wake up every day? What do you want to feel when you wake up every day? What is your goal? And, and, and I don't want to know your financial goal or your material goal. What is the goal you have for the way that you experience how you breathe when you w walk into your day? And in most cases, most people will say, I want peace. I just want peace of mind. And in between peace of mind, there'll be a few F's and blinds because mm. they're frustrated. Yeah. And they'll say, I just want peace of mind. I want to get rid of this. I want to get out of this game. I want to offload the annoyance and the upset and the challenge and the struggle. I want to feel like I have a life again. Yeah. I want to feel less of the anxiety. Mm. And then the next question is, what's the easiest route for you to take to get peace? And in most cases they'll say, if I could just if I could just walk away from this, I'd find a level of peace that would give me the courage I need to keep going down that road. And I say, so why don't you just walk away? And in comes the pride and the ego. Well, I can't. And the missus. I can't. Or the, the, or the husband. Or, yeah, but because sometimes there's you know, one part yeah. is open and the other one sure, isn't, you know, sure. and that causes an issue as well. Yeah, it can cause a tension. Um, and, and the beauty of that is that you've got two different people in the relationship, and that's what allows a balance, and that's what allows a complementary relationship and existence, which is wonderful. But in times like this, it can be, it can be very challenging to allow yourself to allow that imbalance create a balance. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I, do, I just ask, look, you know, why can't you walk away? And that the pride, the ego comes in and says, well, I can't. These efforts did this and these efforts did that. And it's my home and it's my property and it's my business and I'm not going to. And, and, and what will I do if I walk away? And, and all that is is just the uneducated mind and spirit showing you that I don't understand how it's possible to walk. 
So what I do is I simply ask, if you could walk, if you knew how to walk and you knew how to walk easily and to step out of this, would you? And the answer is always, absolutely. Absolutely, I would be gone tomorrow. And then I say, well, there is a way. And let's look at the step one, two, three. But you need to be aware that that walking away, there are two things. One, that walking away is going to change your life forever in ways you can never imagine. And it may cause you to lose everything. But don't fret because you don't have anything anyway. The bank have it. Mm. So you have, have to help people realize that. Yeah. You know, you know, I want to save my home. Sorry, it's not your home. You know, in real terms, we know that your money that you created paid for it, and the solicitor paid the debt, blah, blah, all that we know. But the system doesn't acknowledge it. Therefore, and they have the guards, they have the army, they have the jail cells. So, so they're not going to let you walk away, you know, or believe that it's your home. So the reality is you don't have your home. You're in the system. The system owns everything, you included. And the only way to get out of that is to let go of it. So you may end up losing everything. That's where most people step back and say, okay, I'll stay with the back and never mind the peace. Mm. Because they haven't yet learned to trust. Yeah. And they haven't learned to trust because they don't know who they are. Mm. And they actually think they're human beings. And they uh, think uh, life uh, begins at birth and ends at death. Well, the question has to be asked. Are these people who are actually awake? Because I always... We, we have said on the show before... The battle, if you want to call it, that's going on, it's not just physical, it's spiritual. They just don't want you physically, they want you spiritually, they want you hook, line and sinker. Of course, of course. And 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 it begins, in in particular in a country like Ireland, more so in the past, but, but still quite heavily here, it begins at birth. You know, there is this enormous shamanic ritual that happens called baptism, a christening, where you become one of Christ's people. And at a spiritual level, it's an amazingly powerful ritual. And it literally holds the soul of the child. They use the element of water. They use prayer ritual. They use chant. They use music. They use the, the, the surrounds of the environment that they're in that is laced with messages energetically and visually. They use the parents. They, they use everything to capture that, that thinking, that spirit, that soul. So this battle begins very, very, very young. Mm. Um, so we need to be aware that this, in the bigger picture, this isn't about the bank. It's not about the legal system. Mm. Like what's happening at the moment is an amazing thing. It's a fantastic thing. It's a moment of change. Mm. And it's change into evolution. It's change into the next level of understanding who we are. The problem is that most people don't understand the rules of change. And they don't understand who they are, so they're resisting the change. Mm. And the best way to allow change to happen is get out of its way. Yeah. And if we get out of its way, the change will occur, and all of these systems will tumble and crumble a lot quicker than if we keep fighting them. Yeah. So, so for some people it's important to fight it because karmically that's their journey. They need to take on the battle. They need to tap into the warrior within. They need to tap into the father, the protector, the responsible one. But ultimately, when you look through all that too, the only thing that you have to do here is just step out of the way. As if you're on a motorway and there's a truck coming. So what, when you say the change is coming... How can people recognize the change? How can the person who has a mortgage and has bills coming in and they're concerned about you know, when, how they're going to pay next month's mortgage payment and everything else, what are, they, what are the signs of change to them? Well, well you see, there's, there's as many answers to that question as there are people because it, it varies for every individual. We have some common things, but essentially we're all on our journey on our own. Mm. So what are the signs that the change is coming? Just look around you. The church has collapsed. This thing that once was known to be a great teacher of faith and a carrier of the message of God, we have now discovered essentially was a, was a criminal, crooked, lying Seth organization. Yeah. It was absolutely yeah. corrupt through yeah. and through. And, and let's not beat around the bush on this. It raped the children. Yeah. It beat the children. Mm. You go down to Letter Freck in Ireland, and there is a grave with 61 hearts and each heart represents one of the 61 children from the orphanage that were abused and murdered and buried in a mass grave. Mm. Where is that information? Yeah. And how many people in this country even know that happened? Mm. So look around you. The, 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 the model of faith has collapsed. Yeah. That's a sign. And they're saying within 10 years the church will be gone. That's, That's what, what they're, they're saying. saying. That's what they're saying but if you look at history and history is a great teller of the future. If you look at history, the church has been through, I remember studying ecclesiastical history in Maynooth 
Oh boy, oh boy, has the church been through this and a thousand times worse. And <laughs> survives every time. Well, here's, here's, here's something that I was watching the other day about a bit of history, right? The French Revolution, okay? And to put it in a nutshell, there was rich people, poor people, the rich people were getting away, doing whatever they wanted to do, and there was a massive... Uh, revolution by the people and the uh, aristocracy, kings and queens were brought down to the guillotine and off with the head, mm -hmm. right? So, through history, time and time again, this system has kept on sure. going, happening, you know, the rich mm -hmm. getting richer, the poor getting poorer, yeah. and people struggling. This has repeated itself, and we are either not told about this in history, which we're probably not, yep. why these revolutions and why these things have happened, because it seems to be coming around time sure. and time so again. What, so what have we learned? And Nothing. I, I, well, well, we have learned a lot if we choose to see it, and I'll talk about it in a moment. Mm. The, the other signs of the change are the financial system is collapsing, uh, open your mind radio has a, an enormous listenership and is very successful when it, when it brings people in. They are signs of the change. Like, mm. In 1989, 1990, 1995, this was unheard of. It was, yeah. There were a very small number of people who were classified by most other people as nut cases. Yeah. Now we all seem to be accepting that maybe not so nuts. Mm. And, and maybe like one of the great voices in Ireland for many years who got destroyed and he's gone quiet because of it was Jim Corr. Jim Corr was destroyed. Absolutely destroyed. His own family turned on him. Mm -hmm. It affected the music business, it affected his own wealth, it affected his health because the system would suck him in and use him as an example of this is what happens to you if you stand up with this information. Yeah. We will discredit you and make you look stupid. And, and, and that's what they do, you know, and Jim, there were limits to what Jim did too, I understand that, I know Jim very well, he's a friend of mine, so, and I understand where I think he got it wrong. Well, we've, but, we've but interviewed point, Jim twice. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, but, but the point being that Jim was destroyed, they mm -hmm. absolutely destroyed the guy, and he, he felt that destruction, you know. Yeah. I used to sit with him and he'd say to me, God, Marcus, why, why is the world refusing to hear this? Mm. And you have to say, Jim, it's part of the game, you're not in this for love, you're mm. in this for truth. Yeah. So you've got to keep going and you've got to let go of your need or your expectation to get affirmation, credit or validation. If you're in this for love, forget about well, it. Well, this, this, this is what we keep saying. When we, this, when we were down in Waterford and we, we talked about the waking up process, when you finally wake up, when the penny drops and you realize what's going on, it's like somebody's, uh, as Steve says, um, telling you a secret yeah. and, you, and you want to tell everybody and you're wondering why they're not getting it yeah. and I think when everybody goes through the waking up process we all do the same thing we all start going to friends and family and, yeah. and, and telling them and then it's only after you get you sure. start to understand you so, think hang on yeah. that's not the way so, to do so it so here's, you know? here's part of the problem and here comes a judgement when this happens we all end up sounding like born again Christians yeah, yeah. We try to preach the truth yeah, and convert yeah. the masses. Exactly, yeah. And that goes against the entire fundamental principle of what it is we're doing, which is allow everybody to be in their own reality, regardless of what that is, and let's not judge it. Mm -hmm. And let's create a consciousness of what, what this is really all about and let that experience come through like a powerful light in the dark. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and we talk about people being awake. I know very few people who are awake. I know thousands of people who are speaking the language of awakening and enlightenment, but I know very few who are awake. What's happening is that we're getting pieces of it, which is fine, that's just where we are. We're on the road, we're on the journey, we're on the path, we're getting there. Mm. But I know a lot of people in Ireland, a lot of people in the States, Australia, South America, New Zealand, I could name countries of people I speak to, and they claim to be awake, and they are far from awake. It's an, let me use this analogy. It's like they have got all the right colours together on one side of the Rubik's Cube. And they think that's it. And you've got to say, no, actually there's one, two, three, four, five other sides to get done here. And then they work on getting the second side done and they think this is great. And then three, four and five are practically impossible mm -hmm. for most people. But that awakened is when the Rubik's Cube, when all of the sides are correct. Mm -hmm. And you get it correct by not taking all the pieces out and sticking them back in again. <laughs> That, that you actually get it by the process of living and experiencing the frustration and the hurt and the upset mm. and the anxiety and the joy and the peace and all the things that come with it. So, so there's a lot of talk about being awakened, but there's a lot of sleeping still going on, even among those of us who claim to be awakened. Mm. I don't know how you can be awakened without having some experience of deep level, 
commitment to meditation. Mm. I don't know how you can be awakened without having the experience of traveling, literally traversing the different parallel pa paradigms of who we are, where we're from, mm. and literally allowing yourself spiritually to leave this world and go and explore the other worlds yeah. that are there. And they are as real as this one. They're also as much of an illusion as this one, mm. but, but that's okay. So, so you sit and you ask someone who says they're awake, and I get this all the time. And, and, you know, they say, I'm awake, you know, and, and, and I get it. So what do you get? Well, I get that the game is, it's only a game and the money doesn't exist. And say, okay, but, but what's, what context are you telling me this in? Mm. You know, it's a game in relation to what? You know, and, and people say, well, the universe is this and life is this. And, oh, for God's sake, stop. Stop talking. Because all you're doing is you're going external and talking about what you're seeing and you're not going internal and experiencing what's really there. Mm. And you know a true teacher when you meet one mm. because what they teach creates change. Mm. Now I know a lot of people who claim to be awake and really all they are is angry. Mm. They get one side of the Rubik's Cube but they're angry, mm. they're bitter, they're screaming, they're shouting. Mm. They're, they're, they want to cause damage to the bankers. Mm. They want to cause damage to the legal system. That's not going to work. No. We need to learn to understand that somebody has to take up that role in life. That's and they've taken up that role. That's, it. that's their game. That's I mean, that's, game. that's a game. And it's a game you won't win with them. So no. there's no point even playing so the game. Let them at it. Just step out it, of the game. It, it's like we always kind of talk about this as the game is like Monopoly. And if they, if they follow the rules, then you might have a chance of winning. But they changed the rules. Sure. So you'll never win the game of Monopoly. No. But, but here we are back to what I said earlier. You see, it's a game. The only way to beat the game is actually disengage, step out of the you game. Don't play the game. But most yeah. people don't know how to exist outside mm. the game. Mm. They say it's all BS and I don't want to be a part of it. Yet, they don't know how to live without the rules of the game that they're giving out about. They oh. don't know how to be independent. Yeah. They don't know how to attract what they need in their life. Like I, I mentioned earlier, one of the best things I ever did was stop charging. Mm. It, it resolved all of my life issues. I no longer had to worry about money because it wasn't an issue in my life. This day, I am better off than I've ever been. I am both, at the very same time, absolutely, totally and utterly poverty-strucken, and I have never been as wealthy. Why? Because mm. every single day I wake up, what I need is given to me. Can I ask you somewhere. something? And this maybe just going to be listeners out there thinking the same thing. Do you, ha when you say you've moved away, are you still using a bank account? No. You don't use no. a bank account? No. Okay. No. Are you, so you've no credit cards, you've no laser card or no. anything like that. Purely you're dealing That's with cash. It. The only issue that, we, that I have found is a challenge when you step out of the system, and hopefully this will change in time, is that if you do go to book a flight or you do go, you, there, is, there is an internet reality that you, you, you need, you know. So what I started doing is, like for example, I was away last month, I was in Mexico for a month where my wife is from Mexico, and, uh, and I went in and I just bought in cash in Dublin, you know. Now people say to me, but how can you have cash if you're not in the system? And that's a process of mm -hmm. understanding the fundamental nature of who you are. I literally wake up and what I need I create in my mind. Mm. And that day it gets delivered. Mm. So, you know, one of the beautiful examples of this is that, that next month I'm leaving Ireland. Uh, I'm going to Mexico to work at a very deep, significant level with my wife in, uh, in the world of healing and helping people to understand how to experience the true nature of the self. Um, it's, a, it's a dream to do this kind of work. And we were gifted 200 acres of land in the jungle to do this. Wow. And, and I, being a practical guy, I sat and I said, thank you for the gift. We, we gratefully receive it. There is no rejection. But you now need to leave this sit with me because I need to find out how we finance putting a center on it. Mm. And the gift giver of the land said, well, what would you need? And I said, I don't know. To start off, I don't know. And I threw a number out. And the gift giver said, I'll pay it. Just get out here and do this work. And that's because, would you believe the book? And the work of my wife, my wife in, in, in South America, Central America, North America, she's a very, I guess, for want of a better word, very well-known uh, healer and, uh, and medicine woman. I'm hoping to have her on the show. We're yes. going to talk yeah, about that later. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. So, um, so she's an amazing woman. The work she does is powerful. She's well-known. I, I have, for whatever reason, last year or two, developed quite a significant reputation. So, so this is the gift. And I believe that the creator, the universe itself, life, which really is just me anyway, because mm -hmm. there is nothing only me. We're all one. And there's nothing only you, and I'm just a reflection of who you are, and vice versa. I think life recognizes authenticity, and it says, okay, 
this is a portal that I can walk through. This is a portal. This guy and his wife are honest, they're authentic, they don't have all the answers, they experience the, the, the upset and the fear and the worry, but then they very quickly remember it's only a game and they let it go, and this is what we need to teach the world. Yeah. And what we teach is love, what we teach is peace, what we teach is healing. It's not go to fight and prove that they're wrong. It's, it's learn just to let go. Like what happens if we all let go of the system? Mm. The system, like a bubble that a child blows from its little mm. container of wash up liquid and water, it'll just burst mm. gently, just mm. burst into non-existence. Mm. So, so we have two options, you know, we fight and we burn up our energy and we teach the generations that come after us how to do the same, or we begin to actually become not just awake but to become the awakening. So can we just go back, take a step back. So in essence, if somebody starts having an issue with mortgage payments or they lose their job and that conflict comes to them, yeah. what you're saying is to, to resolve a conflict is not to ignore the conflict, sure. but to, because as we said before we went live, if you have an argument with somebody, you don't resolve it by, by not talking to them. You yeah. resolve it by talking to them. Sure. So you you accept everything they, they ask you or they, they want from you from them, but you go back and say, well, I'll do this, but can you tell me this, this, Absolutely. this, and this? Yeah. And then get into um, into discussion, conversation with them, through letter or, or whatever, email, wherever it is, record it, obviously, and then start asking them the questions sure. that you went on yeah. the search for. Because what I do is very simply this. I say, look... Here, here's where I am with this. You are entitled to have your game and your system. You're entitled to create money, lend money, borrow money, put interest on money. You're entitled to reclaim somebody's home or repossess somebody's home because that's your game. And if somebody chooses to engage with you in your game, well then, that's the rules. You know, yeah. Realize that and, and stop thinking that the bank are doing something that's wrong. The bank are doing what they do. What's wrong is that you're playing the game with them. Mm. So if you don't like the game, stop playing it. But it's not what you're doing if you're getting in, into conversation with them. Sure. But you're playing the game. Sure, at some level. But, but you're playing the game to get the information you need that gives you the door to get out of the game. Okay. So, so I'm not, like, for me, let's just clarify what I mean by playing the game is. Playing the game is feeding the system. Mm. By asking the questions I ask, I'm not feeding their system. I'm feeding my need. Yeah. So I look at their game and I say, this is legitimate. Then I go home to my heart and I check out my values and I say, however, your game does not complement my value system, so I'm leaving. Now I need to find out how I get out of the game, because if I just walk away, the likelihood is you're going to come after me, and I'm going to suffer in some way, and then I'm back entangled. Yeah. So I just find the nicest, 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 tidiest way to do that. And for some people, it's a case of realizing that I want peace, therefore let them have everything. Let them have it. Yeah. Let them have it, and, and find a nice tree on a hill with a view and a tent, and start again. Hmm. Because maybe you'd be better off on a nice hill, in peace, in a tent where you can actually breathe and listen to the silence mm. as opposed to being lost in the game. Oh. Now, I'm not saying we all should just walk away and, and, and do what I do. That's my way. Yeah. But I am aware that if we all allow that to happen, the game just disappears. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, what will happen is people being people, they bloody will recreate the game. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what I've realized is that it's not about getting out of this game. It's about not playing any game mm. and let that be your game. Yeah. Right. And I'm a big believer of you have to give to receive. Sure. You know, it's all karma. Where, you know, that's my perception. Energy is neutral. It's what you do with it. And I call it the, the karmic boomerang. Mm -hmm. You know, if you chuck out bad energy, it's going to come back. Yeah. If you chuck out negative energy. Sure. And so mm -hmm. I do think uh, energy is important. One of the things I always, I've come across, and I don't know whether you, what you think of this, but through my readings and my studying with this, was that... Again, you have to, I know it's a cliche, but you have to love yourself mm -hmm. before the people love you, right? You have to know who you are. You have to be confident with yourself mm -hmm. and accept the fact that, you know, 33% of people will like you. 33% of people won't like you. And 33% of people will be sitting on the fence. So the people that I focus on are the people who like me. Mm -hmm. For the people who don't like me, well, they never like me, no matter what I do. Yeah. So I'm not going to wear a mask. I try and be their friend. I try and put on a personality that is not mine just so they like me. I have gotten over that. So I focus and I accept. And I say to people, look, this is me. This is who, who I am. If you like me, great. If you don't, you don't. That's mm -hmm. fine. But I'm not going to put on a mask or pretend to be somebody yeah. I'm not. This is me. Yeah. And I think what people have to realize is... They will never please everybody. 
And it, sometimes it's down to insecurity or low self-esteem and a lot of these issues. And that's why people try to be friends with everybody sure. because they feel that that's, that's what they have to be. Yeah, and, and there is a point even beyond that too, I think, that, that we need to try in some way to begin dropping into the consciousness of the awakening that's happening. And that is to even move beyond the need to, to deal with people who you would label as like me or don't like me. It, yeah. Let's get rid of all the labels. Mm. Because I don't, I don't care whether you like me or don't like mm. me. I'm just being true to me. Yeah. I'm living my life and but, my truth. But to put it in a language so they understand sure. if they're sure. beginning on the sure. path, yes. you, you have to use labels sure. because people being people... Yeah, well, to put it in context, you yeah. have to... It's, it's what, yeah. well, I think what's, what the word best to describe that would be the, the word enculturation, where you meet people where they are. And you bring them from there through gentle yeah. understanding and gentle life experience to, to, to see as you perceive from where you perceive and what you perceive. Mm -hmm. And that allows them the choice to say, ah, I'm going to stay here now and mm -hmm. I'm going to live from this model of awareness as opposed to going back to the one where I actually my eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the physical, literal eyes, I mean the eyes of the, 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 the deep eyes of wisdom of, of what life is really about, you know. So, so yeah, I think you just, we just got to work with people to say, look, we can't allow this system to to do what it's doing and continue doing it because yeah. it's preventing the evolution but that doesn't mean we have to go kicking and screaming and lock and load and, and, and create bloodshed yeah. emotionally, psychologically or physically what we need to do is we need to really understand that we have to learn to challenge the system by not feeding the system yeah. and learn how to get what we need to get out of the system so you know if I were to throw the keys of my house back at the bank tomorrow I need to be aware that the consequence is a judgement ok well we have um, a few minutes left so let's talk about solutions and the future sure in the next year and a few months there's loads of things going around as to what's going to happen you know they, they're kicking the can down the road regarding the euro loads of predictions of things that might happen globally um, not just financially but you know from a uh, uh, Goya based mm -hmm. scenario what's going to happen what's your take on, on all of that how do you perceive what you I mean with your wife who's very who's a healer and very tuned in as well mm -hmm. What do you feel, in your own opinion, you feel is going to happen within the next few months, 2012, and maybe next year? Well, I can answer that for me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I can answer it for anything or anyone else. Um, but, but let's kind of play around there for a moment. I believe that we are going to go through an enormous, enormous uh, experience of, of seeing and experiencing the shift that we're in the middle of. That's for sure. I think most people are screwed. Most people have no chance. And I don't mean that to be negative. I, I, I mean it simply to be honest. And most people have no chance because they're not allowing themselves to see beyond it. They're staying stuck and loyal to the cynicism, to the sarcasm, to the fear of believing something beyond what they've been educated to believe. I believe that there is an enormous amount of ego fear and that creates ego greed mm -hmm. and therefore people want to keep what they have like I know and I know you're aware of this there are people out there who are supposedly awakened and helping people understand this yet they're charging a bloody fortune for the information mm. so, so that, that just doesn't sit right so, so all those people are just going to experience a deeper version of what they're in yeah. emotionally well, and psychologically mm. however mm. I do believe for those who choose to, to begin the process of awakening and to begin the process of experiencing true enlightened uh, awakening um, that this is the time there, there are energetically there are portals all over the place where you opening where you can access deep levels of understanding and awareness with, with a lot less meditation than used to be needed because we are literally frequency driven at a much higher rate than we used to be yeah. the vibration is powerful the, the pulse of the earth has increased by 67 or 68 percent in the last 15 years mm. so we energetically the information is available in a way it never was before so a little bit of gentleness quietness stillness like today I came here from meeting a guy who he was still having a rough time. He's a farmer guy, he's in his 50s. And he was just experiencing the whole question of, Marcus, what's my purpose? What's my, what, what, what's my meaning? I, like, I, I came through millions and millions of euro. I'm now broke. And I've realized, I've been here twice in my life. What's this about? Mm. And I said to him, look, you're a man of the land. You, 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 you spent most of your life farming. Go find a quiet corner with a tree and sit under it and meditate. And you will come home with the answer. And that's what the future is for those who choose to get it. You, f you find people who are doing this out of anger, they're just going to create more anger. You get what you focus on. Yeah. yeah. So it ex expands. Yeah. What you focus yeah. on expands. Yeah. So for, for, those of who, for those who choose to go into it, uh, transcendence, 
and, and expansion are there. But most of the world won't even see it. They won't even recognize it because they don't believe it happens. And then for the rest of the population, just more of what has been. But I don't think it's bad or good. I think it's just the way it's meant to be. And the truth is, even though we say a lot of people are screwed, nobody's really screwed because they are exactly where they're meant to be to experience what it is they have to learn to evolve into who it is they truly are. And all that is is a journey of remembering. Mm. We're, we're just here to remember that I am all there is. Mm. I am this. I am a spiritual being. I'm having a human experience. You and I are one. There is no separation. At a human intellectual level, that makes no sense. But at a deep heart meditative level, it makes perfect sense. And you need to go seeking that understanding, that awareness. You need mm. to go seeking the self-healing to realize that God, Gaia, Tara, mm. the Green Mother of Ireland, the Emerald Jewel that she is, they're all just names for the same thing. You know, uh, one of the beautiful things in the Mayan community in Mexico, um, and my wife would be referred to as the Mayans, as, um, as Guadalupe, the, the, the Guadalupe, which is the, the Virgin which is a Catholic term, you know, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Yeah. But, but when they refer to her as Guadalupe, or they refer to her work as the work of the mother, they don't mean it in a Catholic sense. They just know that Guadalupe is just a Catholic word for Gaia. Mm. So we're just happy to use the words that describe what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. It's all one. The same way God is only three letters, and we've, we've chosen to call it God, but, sure. uh, it, you know, it's just that, that could be yeah. a shoe or, so, you know, so door, yeah. you know, so, whatever. So, so yeah. give, well, give a very simple example of that. Let's have a little story about there is this thing called God, and God loves you, and God gives you all you need, and God is the provider, and you are the recipient of God's love, and you discover you are God. Now, change that story. Say it the same story again, and change the word God with life. Mm. Life is the giver, and you are the receiver, and God, life will give you everything you need, and you just have to recognize that life gives it to you so you can realize that you are life. Same thing, different word. Mm. All to describe the same beautiful thing. Mm. So I believe the only way forward for those who truly want peace is to go deep into the heart. The way forward for those who are still at the journey of being a warrior is to draw your sword, go onto the battlefield. The advice I would give those people is read the way of the warrior, read the samurai, read the understanding of a martial art. Mm. We all know that the samurai goes to the battlefield, he puts his head down, he puts his hand on the sword, he doesn't move. He does not go looking for a fight. Mm. And he will never draw his sword out of anger. He will never take a life out of anger because it creates a karma. He just stays on the battlefield. Mm. And if he needs to defend himself for the purpose only of evolution mm. and living to grow more, he'll draw his sword. Otherwise, he'll let himself be taken out. So we need to mm. learn. We literally need to learn to die. And that means we need to learn to let the bank win. Mm. Step out. They'll think they're winning. But the more of us that step off and step out, like a hot air balloon, if we all jump out, it'll just disappear into the stratosphere. Yeah. It'll just take off and mm. there won't be enough weight to hold it down. And of course, the bank's in so much trouble at the moment anyway, so if people start doing that. The story I was going to quickly say was, uh, I heard a story about Bruce Lee. And, you know, Bruce Lee being who he was and how good he was at what he did, but yet, if he was walking down the road and there was a gang of guys at the end of the road, he'd literally cross the road to avoid them. Sure. And you would think, like, you know, he wouldn't need it. But he did because he avoided conflict. Because, yeah. you know, the whole idea of having that ability is purely from a defensive point of view. Mm -hmm. But he learned it so he didn't have to fight, which is yeah. the cliche. And, and, and even, even more, with the Western understanding of martial arts is you, you have it as a defensive mechanism, that's all. The actual true and deep understanding, certainly when I train myself in, 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 in some of the arts of the Eastern philosophy, you realize that it's actually not even a defense system. It's allowing yourself to work with the energy system. That's like, right, yeah. That if yeah. needed, can defend you in a moment of darkness or trouble. But you do it only to experience the breath, the in-breath and the mm. out-breath. It's mm. all about the gentle movement of the energy. That is all that you are, really. You're just like Tai Chi. It's, it's all slow. It's all good. And it's gentle and it's beautiful and it's life giving as opposed to life taking. And it's, it's similar to I a, a friend of mine who, when I, when I worked in London, he went over to Brazil to go to John of God. You probably heard of John of God, have yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And he said he was taught a, a, a dance, but it was an energy dance. And whatever way the dance was designed, it was purely to improve the flow of energy with your body. So it's kind of a Tai Chi, but this was a mm. dance. So it's just funny that it's all, and there's more people opening up to, sure. to the bigger picture with that. Yeah. But um, I'm going to pass over to Steve. What we normally do at the end of the show is get all your details and put all the information in of what's going on. I'd like to say a big thank you. Now, it's great having you in the studio because we did say that you were going to come down to the studio, which is great that you're down here. Um, just a big thank you that you've come down. Thanks a lot for all the information. Enjoy the interview. Brilliant information. 
pass you over to Steve, and Steve can... Right, well, I'd like to just echo what Alan has said. I know I've been very, very quiet, but I, fe- I, I felt... Very, very quiet, yeah, too. Well, very well quiet. I'm sorry, but I felt at this moment... Uh, well, I, I felt, like, with the flow of energy between Marcus and, and, and yourself, <laughs> that I just needed to be a sponge, oh, like, I... like SpongeBob. I just need to absorb what was being said. Um, and I'm sticking to that. Okay, right. Okay. That's your excuse. So you, okay. can't, you can't say anything to me. Oh, right. Anyway, that's, that's, that's my journey. All right. Okay. Anyway, uh, Marcus, it's uh, normally at the end of the show, so we just ask you: can you, can you give um, our listeners uh, maybe your website address, or even if you want to plug the book again, or anything else that you feel would help people who are listening to this uh, learn more about what you spoke of, and, and maybe at some point in time get in touch with with Aaron ourselves. Sure. Um, website is www. Marcus McKeown, M A R C U S M C K E O W N dot com. Uh, on the website you will find my address, my home address, you will find my phone number. Uh, people are welcome to phone me, write to me, email me. I, I respond to everything. Uh, sometimes it takes two or three days, but I do respond to everything within 72 hours. Um, and yeah, you know, as in from September, for most of the time I'm going to be in Mexico. I will be coming back into Ireland to run programs and that, but uh, we will have a residential facility. People are welcome to come. The centre is, it's actually probably wrong to call it a centre. It's going to be an ashram more than a centre, but there'll be a lot of training work, a lot of learning, a lot of work that's going on there. It's donation based. They can come spend a bit of time with us, have some fun. And in relation to the book, how the banks are screwing you and what you can do about it, I would sincerely say to any of you listening, if you'd like a copy of it, uh, go on to Open Your Mind, go on to the website, uh, O-Y-M dot OYMIreland.com. OYMIreland.com. Uh, the book is there. It is available. Uh, get a copy for a donation. I don't get any of the money. I don't want it. It is there to support you becoming aware and to support OYM in the work they're doing. So it's donation only. If you do order one, I would ask that if you're in Ireland, allow €4 Euro for postage and packaging, and outside Ireland, €5 Euro for postage and packaging, and then offer whatever the, the is, is there a fixed price on it? Well, we've, we've just put down €12, Euros, which includes the packaging. Okay, that's cool. That excellent, enough? excellent. And it's well worth it. So, you know, and the information in the book, at some level, is the entry level stuff, but it's very, it's very it, powerful. It's to very have good. It. There are also a list of questions in the book that I guarantee if you put them in front of a bank, your life's going to change. Yeah. Because the bank will not know what to say. And those questions, if answered, the bank know that they've exposed themselves, so they will not answer them. Now, if you choose to take on this battle and you do end up in court, you very simply say, Judge, before we go any further, I need for due process to take place. Mm-hmm. I need to prepare a proper defence, which I believe the court is required, it requires me to have. The judge will agree. And you then say, Your Honour, in order for due process to happen and for me to have a defence, I need these questions answered, which the bank have refused to answer. I'm asking the court to order the bank to answer them. That moment, everything changes. Everything changes. And it was the threat of doing that that changed a lot of my situations. Fantastic. And all the questions are in the book. In the book. I will say the one thing that really uh, appealed to me regarding Marcus was that um, you accept donations. Sure. You're not charging. You know, we, you do seminars, you do a lot of seminars, and all your seminars you say, give me a donation. Yep. You know, as you say, this information is out there. And there is an element of, I know people say, well, we have, you know, um, we have to rent a hall and it has to be paid for. But donations are as good as anything to, you, you know, believe people it. believe in the information yeah. and like it. And, and you don't need to, you know, people have got caught up in this, maybe it's the Celtic Tiger mentality. You need a big fancy hotel room with big fancy microphones. And you need 500 people in the room. No, you don't. Mm. You don't need anything fancy. Mm. You just need truth. Yeah. Authenticity. Yeah. Check in. Ask the heart what to do. And people will know. They know you're speaking of from course. the heart. They'll just feel it. Because I have changed my thinking. And what I kind of say to people is, instead of how do you think about that, I say how do you feel about that, mm-hmm. which is more from the heart than the, the head. Absolutely. Well, Marcus, brilliant. Thanks a lot for coming on. And what we'll do is we'll go to a musical break, and we'll be back after this. My pleasure. Thank you. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMIreland.com, cnsradio.ning.com, and icradionetwork.com. And we're back, and that was a pre-recorded interview with Mr. Marcus McKeown. And uh, I'm sure you will agree, every word he speaks is gold. It is, in my opinion, anyway. Well, I mean, I mean, even though we, Alan and myself, 
we're here for the for the interview. It was actually a pleasure just to sit back here and relax, put the feet up, so to speak, and and listen to the information again. It's it just it's fantastic, fantastic stuff. And when when we actually called time on the interview. Marcus said he could actually go on for another two hours. Yeah. Because he said it felt like it wasn't an interview, that we were just talking to him as we were just sitting in the pub having a drink. And that's, that's the kind of way we like doing it, isn't it? That's when we talk to guests. Yeah, we like to bring him down to the pub. <laughs> we wish. So just, you know, just a couple of things that Marcus did say there. And we had Ben Gilroy on the show as well. Ben's been on a couple of times. And the two of them have had a lot of experience going into court doing Mackenzie Friends and everything else. And the one thing the two of them do say, between the two of them, is that the system doesn't work. They've tried it. They've tried different things. They've tried different ways and different methods and everything else. And the system just keeps changing the rules to suit themselves. And as Marcus said, as soon as they think there's going to be a win, they change the rules so that doesn't happen again. So... You have to step away from the system, or at least try and, as Ben said, try and approach it from a, a common law approach, if you can. But, you know, it's uh, very good information. As Marcus said, we are going to try and get his wife on in a, in a few weeks' time to talk about what she knows, all about the 2012 stuff as well. And the book is available. I've read the book. The book is really, really fantastic. Great information in there for people who want to understand what the banks are doing and how they're doing it, and what you can do about it. I mean, you, there's nothing in the law that says that you can't ask questions, and that's all you're going to be doing if you want to go down that road. And speaking of questions, uh, Marcus did tell us as well that a lot of the questions that he would ask the bank that leave them kind of red-faced and a little bit flummoxed, he, he has put those questions in the book as well. So, I mean, if anyone does uh, want to go down the road of taking on the bank, uh, the, 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 the questions are all there. Exactly. So, as I say, the book is on the site if you want to order it. All donations go to OIM. Thanks to Marcus for that. I will be seeing Marcus during the week anyway. I'm going to meet up with him for a coffee and a chat about a few things. Um, so, next week's show, we're going to have John Perkins on. Now, John is the Confessions of an Economic Hitman, the book they wrote on Hoodwinked. And hopefully John's going to be on. don't know how long he's going to be on for because it is Sunday, he'll probably be on for an hour or so, probably something around that, maybe longer. And we're going to get an update, because John was over here, a corporate coffee, yeah, that's right. John was over here in Ireland doing a seminar uh, for the, um, um, it wasn't uh, for the Seven Indo, was it? It was just a, Ian Crane and all that was over, yeah? Ian Crane and that came over. And uh, so we're going to touch base with John about how we got on with that seminar and what's happening in the world now, what's, what does he see happening, because we're getting updates on that. Um, and obviously we have just a few of the things that's uh, in the pipeline as well, a few of the you know, good guests coming on. So it'll be good information. So just to touch base on a couple of things we said for the people who joined late in the show. Um, we had the Illuminata clock, which we talked about, Illuminata orders that end info. That was um, set to go off. The countdown was at one, one, two, one, 23 minutes past 1, 33 seconds. And that countdown clock is now past its, its countdown time. So I don't know why that is. We do have the 21st. We have that article about NASA talking about the 21st of September being when the solar flare is possibly going to go off. The last time, it's called the... Um, I forget the name of the actual effect, the Carrington effect. And the reason why it's called the Carrington effect is because in 1859 we had the same solar flare hit the earth and all the telegraph poles got blown out. But because we didn't have electronics and a power grid, it wasn't too much of a problem. So if that same Carrington effect hits the earth, then we're going to have major problems. And they're saying, NASA are saying apparently, the 24th of September, as I said, we're only passing the information on, we're not saying it's going to happen, but check it out for yourself. And the next date, and we'll talk to John Moore about this when he comes on the show, will be the third week in October. Maybe that's why they call the October surprise, because they're talking about Russian troops and Chinese troops in America. Maybe they're getting ready for martial law, because they are moving stuff from the east coast of America, moving away from the coast because maybe they're expecting something. But we have a busy week. Well, we're going to be meeting and greeting this week as well. Don't forget the Stuart <coughs> Stridlow vid video is on our YouTube channel now. We, we interviewed Stuart last week, and it's up there in their lives. So if you want to uh, listen to Stuart 
and the interview we did with Stuart. Stuart actually talks about the pole shift. He, he says there's something going to happen as well. Um, so we're getting it from all sorts. But there you go, Steve. That's um, the information that's come in. That's all good. Uh, well, it's all bad, actually. <laughs> It's uh, not, a, not a good piece in there at all. If you're not depressed, you you, you will be by the, by the time we're finished. Um, that's not fair. I shouldn't say that. That's not true at all. We're we're always offering solutions uh, as an as a kind of a partnership with with uh, with, with TNS Radio, the lads at TNS. We we do kind of try to offer solutions where possible. And uh, do we, are we going to mention mention the thing that we weren't going to mention? By any chance, or are we not going to bother? Oh, we'll do that next week. Okay. We're not going to mention the thing that we're not going to mention. We'll, we'll, talk, mention we'll talk about it next week. <laughs> now, we are... We Keep were, you in suspense. We were planning to have um, Whitewash on, um, but unfortunately, we, we knew, we because it was a pre-record, we just ran out of time. So what we're going to do is, we're going to get Sean on um, next week. We're going to be talking to Sean. Well, we'll talk to Sean later after the show, but we will get Sean on next week if Sean wants to come on Whitewash. And we're going to be talking about stuff in America and what's going on in America because there is a lot of things going on over there which will have a, probably an effect over here. It always happens. What annoys me though a lot of the time, and this is my soapbox moment for like one minute, is that a lot of the information from people, especially on, in the States, and I know that's where they live, but it seems that there's only one country in the world and that's America. Which is annoying because there are other countries in the world. I mean, there's quite a few of other countries in America, bar America. So oh, we'll be talking to John about that, and I'll just kind of, in, in a nice way, say, John, when you're talking on your show, can you just include Europe as well, because we are over here, we do exist. I know you live in America, but you know we'd like to know what's going on. If you have some inside information, that would be nice. Now, we're going to have a pre-record of Lindsay Williams. We got asked to get Lindsay back on the show, and obviously for obvious reasons, Pastor Lindsay Williams can't do Sunday because he's busy in his church. So we're going to do a pre-record <clears throat> and we're going to get uh, Lindsay Williams on and hopefully we'll get an update from Lindsay as to what he thinks is going on from his insider information. So that's the plan of attack there. Steve? Yeah, no, it, it was actually nice. Uh, Alan was, was telling me, I think we might, might have mentioned it last week, that Pastor Williams, he was kind enough to, to actually contact us and I'm not sure if it's a worldwide exclusive, but he, he did say that he had some information that he, he wished to share with us and uh, we, we are kind of uh, humbled that he would actually, you know, include us in, in his list of uh, I, I, I'd say friends that, that he wishes to share the information with so we're, yeah we're going to hook up with, with uh, Lindsay uh, Williams during the week and um, we'll, we'll do a little a little, a little pre-record as Alan said just similar to the one you heard with, with uh, Marcus uh, not sure when it, obviously depending on the information that Lindsay Williams uh, gives us will kind of depend how, uh, whether the, uh, the, the podcast or the show will be broadcast sooner or later uh, it, we, we, we'll say we know more during the week, so just watch the watch the schedule on OYM, and you'll you'll, you'll see when and uh, when Pastor Williams will be on. Exactly. Right. Okay. Before we go, what's happening on TNS? Um, what's happening on TNS? Well, uh, when you're finished here, definitely uh, tune into tnsradio.ning.com, um, and I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 I did kind of tic-tac with Vin earlier, and he's he doesn't have anyone lined up at the moment. But I say that was that was about 45 minutes ago. He may have someone on now, but it doesn't matter uh, whether Vin has a guest lined up or not. It's always a pleasure to tune into TNS and just listen to Vin shoot the breeze because he, the the man always has something very very interesting to speak about. So exactly. So yeah, when you're done here, pop on over to TNS. Right. Okay. So uh, for the moment, just uh, stay safe. Send us over send us over any links that you come across because the links are great. We get the information out. Make sure you register. If you're not registered, register and you'll be privy to the links that we're going to be sending out there and um, during the week. And if anything happens, let us know. It doesn't matter what country you're in. Keep us posted. We have a lot of international listeners, I know. And so keep us posted if anything, anything is happening. Yes, I know. We don't, okay, don't register. Subscribe. How's that? <laughs> okay, guys. Listen, have a good one. Stay safe. And we'll talk to you soon. This is uh, Alan James. Uh, good night. Okay, and it's a good night for me as well. And just uh, remember, if you need a copy of uh, How the Banks Are Screwing You and What You Can Do About It, uh, pop along to the website there, order a copy. If you, if you don't need one for yourself, maybe get one for a friend or even get two uh, and, you know, get one for yourself and give one to someone who may benefit from the information because it, it, the, the information, it needs to be shared. So that's it. Talk to you all next week. Have a good one from Steve and George. Take care. Bye-bye.